think that we'll have more people coming in um, in the next couple of minutes. But we want to get a lot of information out here on a big schedule, and we want to make sure that we can all get you out right at 5 o'clock. So we're going to get started. My name is Ashley Huebner. I'm managing attorney at the National Immigrant Justice Center with our asylum project and our Immigrant Children's Protection Project. Um, we have a number of other folks here from NSJC as well as Catholic Charities who will be presenting today. Um, in the front here, we have uh, Carolina, who registered both of you for the training today. She's our pro bono coordinator at NIJC. And if you decide that you're interested in taking my case after today, um, she'll be the one you want to contact. Next to her is Molly, who is a supervisor in our children's project um, and works directly with um, the children that we're going to be talking about today. Next to her is Kathleen, who's a paralegal in our children's project, and we'll be talking about how to work with children and, and do the Know Your Rights presentation with them. And then all the way to the right here is Elizabeth from Catholic Charity, We'll be talking about the state court piece that's involved with some forms of relief that immigrant children are seeking. Um, so, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping matters. First, a huge thanks to Ken Weinberg and Denton for hosting the training today and providing the delicious treats in the back and the drinks and everything. Um, for printing all of the materials today. In front of you are a number of materials related to the presentation, um, including an agenda for today, a printout of the PowerPoint. Um, an evaluation, which at the end of this training today, we would ask that you all complete the evaluation. In return, you give the evaluation to Carolina, and she will give you your CLE certificate for today. Um, so make sure to stay for the very end. Um, we also have our case list of cases currently in need of representation. This includes children and adults, and we'll be talking today why, um, in the midst of this influx of children crossing the border, it's still very important that pro bonos provide representation to adults who are seeking asylum and other police. Um, and many of the materials for NIJC are also available on our website. So if you go to immigrantjustice.org, as an attorney, there are numerous materials available to you, whether you're representing an asylum seeker, an individual seeking other immigration relief, or for children who are seeking um, assistance in pursuing the process on their own. There are numerous posting materials on our website. And we also have a number of policy documents regarding the current policy situation involving immigrant children, which we'll be talking about today as well. Can everyone hear me okay if I don't stand by the uh, microphone? Microphone? Oh, yeah. Okay. So NIJC is an immigration legal service provider located here in Chicago, but we do national work as well. We provide immigration legal services to low-income immigrants, asylum seekers, and refugees in Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. And then we use that information that we learn from our direct service to further our advocacy, policy, and litigation goals that we do nationwide. A number of our, our opportunities and our projects that we have at NIJC are based on pro bono service. So, for example, our asylum project here at NIJC is 99.9% .9 served by pro bono attorneys like many of you. Um, at any given time, we have about 250 asylum seekers that we're providing representation for. Our asylum project consists of Carolina, myself, and another staff attorney. We are not staffing most of those cases. They are being handled by attorneys like you, and we depend heavily on your assistance. We also have pro bono opportunities for individuals who would like to represent a child in a special immigrant juvenile status petition, and we'll talk more about that in a bit, um, for doing Know Your Rights presentations for detained children, for VAWA and Uvisa cases, we'll talk more about that later, for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, this is the DACA program that Obama announced about two years ago for certain immigrant children, and then prosecutorial discretion cases, so advocating for the government to stop attempting to deport an individual. For all of our pro bono programs, NIJC is heavily involved, so if you take a pro bono case from us, you can be assured that we will be assisting you from start to finish. When a client first comes to us seeking representation, we conduct in-depth case screening and assessment to determine that the individual is actually eligible for the relief that he or she is seeking. Once we've done that, and we determine that the individual is eligible for relief, then we put their case on the case list that you have in front of you. If there's a case that interests you, then you contact us. We send you information for your conflict check, and then the case is yours. You're representing the client in court or before an immigration agency. You're preparing affidavits and immigration forms. So we're here for the process to assist you with anything you may need. We provide regular trainings on all pro bono topics that we have. We have in-depth manuals on our website and other material, sample documents that you may need. And then you're always able to contact us if you have any questions ranging from, can you review my brief? What is my judge like? How do I find an interpreter? How do I reach to my client? Anything that you may need throughout the process. All right. 
So without further ado, we're going to jump right into what you all came here to talk about today, which is what's going on with the children who are coming to the border and seeking protection here in the United States. So Molly's going to provide some background on the situation, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the legal and policy side of it. Okay. So to get started, um, this is probably a term that you all have seen in news articles recently. Um, it's a very prominent issue in the media right now. Um, so unaccompanied alien children are defined as children that have no lawful immigration status, have not reached um, the age of 18, um, and when there's no parent or legal guardian in the U.S., when no parent or legal guardian in the United States is available to provide care and physical custody. Um, and IJC and a number of other organizations have moved on to using the term unaccompanied immigrant children, um, because we feel that the term alien is dedicated in my department or my department. So there are a lot of different players that are involved in um, the chain of events that applies to UITs as, as they enter the United States. So further on in the presentation, Ashley's going to show us the route that the children take to arrive in the United States. Um, but once they get here, um, they are apprehended by Customs and Border Protection. Um, again, you might have seen this in the news. A lot of the kids actually come and turn themselves in to CBP. Um, they come with their parents or their family members, phone numbers, taped into the inside of their clothing. Um, so they know that they are going to be apprehended once they enter the U.S. Um, they are initially in the custody of CBP um, until they can be transferred into the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, so just to kind of get a sense of um, the players here with the Department of Homeland Security, um, ICE, and those are the, the trial attorneys and prosecutors in immigration court, Customs Border Protection, as I mentioned, that's who apprehends the kids as they come into the United States, and USCIS, who adjudicates immigration benefits, including asylum applications, and that's here in Chicago, that would be in Chicago's local asylum office. The Executive Office for Immigration Review, is the, immigration, the immigration court, um, is within EOIR. All of the kids upon entering the United States are issued a notice to appear and will have to appear before an immigration judge for removal proceedings. Um, and then the Office of Refugee Resettlement is the agency within the Department of Health and Human Services um, that is in charge of the care and custody of the children. So the children from CBP are then transferred to the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement, or ORR. Um, typically, that, that should be within 72 hours, with the current influx of children, that's been extended to anywhere from 5 to 10 to 15 days before the kids are able to move to um, OR custody where they're placed in shelters. And here in Chicago, um, there are approximately 500 children at any point in time that are in OR custody through a program that's run by Harlan Alliance. The number um, as you may well know, have increased dramatically in the past year. Last year, in all of fiscal year 2013, um, the total of 24,000, a little more than 24,000 children entered the U.S. as UITs. And by June of this year, it was 26,000, this 2014 fiscal year. And the most recent numbers that we've seen are now 57,000. Um, in throughout part of June, there were reports about 400 children were being apprehended every day, um, and now that's gone down to about 500 a week. So things are, numbers are going down, but the children that have already entered are here and have um, a lot of, of hurdles to overcome in terms of their legal situation. The majority of the children that are coming into the United States are coming from three countries in Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador, which is defined as the Northern Triangle of Central America. Um, the 
social and political dynamic of those three countries is really different from other countries in southern South America, like Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama, and also different from, um, from Mexico. But there's a lot of relationship between the situation of crime and delinquency in the Northern Triangle and in Mexico, um, a lot of criminal networks that all work together. So we put some stats up here for you to get a sense of where children are coming from and what they're facing in their home countries. Um, Honduras has long had a really complicated situation in addressing gang problems, but since the uh, 2009 to Mount Celaya, the situation became a lot worse just because the government, the infrastructure was a lot weaker. And so addressing the criminal issues that were already a huge problem was just kind of gone unaddressed and gotten out of control. Has the highest murder rate in the world of any country that's not currently at war. Um, so what the kids are running from is, is really quite quite frightening. So I'll let you go ahead and take a look at some of the statistics. Um, you can see the disappearance of women and girls has increased by 281 percent from 2008 to 2013. We've also seen a dramatic increase in the girls that are coming to UICs in the past year. So that increase violence against women and girls is reflected in the numbers that we're also seeing of people that are fleeing from Central America. Again, El Salvador and Guatemala also very complex situations in terms of crime and violence. Um, so we, um, all the children that we work with through NIJC receive a Know Your Rights presentation and a legal screening. And these are some of, um, some of the things that the children that we have met with have told us about why they come to the United States. Um, going back to the issue of violence against women, my mother's ex-boyfriend threatened to rape me and chop me into little pieces. Then his friends told me I would have to be their woman. I'm afraid to return and live with my mother because her ex and his friends could find me again. When I was coming here on the train, a guy raped me. This is a very typical story that we see. We also see a lot of girls that are coming and saying, this happened to one of my friends, this happened to one of my schoolmates. I received a message from the gang, and now I think it's going to happen to me. Um, so even if this hasn't touched directly the children that we are working with, they see it all around them all of the time. So I'm going to talk about what happens to the children once they get here. So Molly talked a little bit about the reasons why they come, why they're fleeing um, these countries in Central America, and why they're fleeing now. So there's a couple of, of um, pieces of, of law and case law that are relevant to the current situation. So the first major major case law was this case called Flores Reno in 1997. And this was back when there was IMS instead of DHS. It was a very different situation um, in terms of the AP. He set up with a government agency. But at that time, there was a class action settlement that established certain standards regarding the treatment of unaccompanied immigrant children. Um, in the past, children were being detained by IMS, which at that time was also prosecuting them. So the same, the same agency that was prosecuting the children was detaining them. So they would be detained with adults. So they would be held for long periods of time. Um, so Flores was one of the first sort of chips away at the poor treatment of children that was going on at the time. The Homeland Security Act of 2003 is what established the Department of Homeland Security. It also did something very significant. It gave the jurisdiction over the care and custody of children to the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So, like Molly said, at this point in time, even though kids are initially stopped by the Department of Homeland Security through Customs and Border Patrol, they are then turned over to the Office of Refugee Resettlement. The primary piece of law, however, that, that currently impacts children and that is a big um, point of contention in the current policy debate is the CPRA of 2008, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. This did a number of very significant things for unaccompanied immigrant children. Um, the first thing it did was it separated the treatment of children at the border depending on whether they are a child coming from a contiguous country or a non-contiguous country. And really for our purposes, the only contiguous country that matters is Mexico. We're not seeing a lot of children coming from Canada right now. So the 
main way it differentiates is Mexican children can be returned to their country much easier, much more quickly than so every other child who is unaccompanied who reaches our border. So if unaccompanied Mexican child comes to the border, that child can be immediately repatriated unless the child is deemed a potential trafficking victim, the child has an asylum claim or a fear of return, or the child does not voluntary, voluntarily accept return. Now the individuals who are determining whether the child is a potential trafficking victim or has an asylum claim is Customs and Border Patrol. So the same officers, again, that are apprehending the children often and forth are the ones who are making this determination whether or not the child can be returned. There was a UNHCR study that was done um, fairly recently and only became public very recently um, that basically found that there are incredible problems with this process, that there were reports of Mexican children who came to the border were very afraid to reveal that they had been the victim of, of sexual violence, that they had been trafficked, that a cartel was after them, because they feared that information would get out and then they would be returned to Mexico and they would be killed. And that as the children were being driven back to Mexico across the border, they would then reveal something to the Border Patrol officer, but the Border Patrol officer would say, the paperwork's done, I can't turn around. And the kids would be voluntarily returned voluntarily to Mexico at that time. So this has been a significant problem for some time. However, it's gotten minimal attention because these children are never coming into the United States in the first place. All other unaccompanied children are treated very differently. So like Molly said, most children are coming to the border and turning themselves into Customs and Border Protection. They are not you know, sneaking across the border and making their way in. They actually turn themselves in. At the point when they are apprehended, they must be transferred to OR custody with 72 hours. This is a requirement under the law. Again, because of the current influx, this has not been happening. And there have been incredible problems as a result of the length of time children are spending in CBP custody. Uh, back in June, NIJC and several other organizations filed a mass complaint on behalf of 116 unaccompanied children regarding their mistreatment and abuse in CBP custody at the border. And this treatment ranged from being held in freezing cold conditions, being provided insufficient food and water, being detained with adults who sexually assaulted them, being um, physically and verbally abused by CBP officers. So this is a serious issue and, and one of the serious concerns, particularly given the current policy debate that we'll talk about in a second. The CBPRA did a couple other things that are particularly significant for asylum and for special serving juvenile status. And we'll talk more about those forms of relief at the end. But one thing it did for asylum is it created certain protections for children. Um, individuals seeking asylum normally have to file for asylum within one year of their entry. They got rid of this requirement for unaccompanied children. They also gave initial asylum jurisdiction to the asylum office for all unaccompanied children. As Molly mentioned, when children are apprehended at the border, they are placed in immigration court removal proceedings. Normally, when you're in immigration court, you can only seek asylum before an immigration judge in an adversarial process. The TDPRA said that even though these kids are in proceedings, the asylum office, which is a non-adversarial process, shall have jurisdiction over these children's cases. So that was significant. For special immigrant juvenile status purposes, it created one parent special immigrant juvenile status. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means in a bit. So the TDPRA was a huge step forward and was very significant for the treatment of unaccompanied immigrant children. However, it's currently under attack, and most of the bills that have been proposed and have, in some cases, passed by the House in recent weeks um, have really gone to attack the TDPRA and specifically attack the difference between how contiguous and non-contiguous children are treated. Specifically, they have wanted to put all children on equal footing. And the way they frame it as, children will all be treated equally. That would be a good thing. I'll be treated the same way. But really what it means is they are significantly copying the protection of all other children to the very poor protections that Mexican children have currently. Um, they also call for the expedited screening of unaccompanied children. So Cronin um, and Cuellar put out um, a bill a couple weeks ago which then was implemented in the House bill that was passed last week. Um, and these provisions dramatically decrease the, the due process protections for children. So one thing they do is instead of having children being transferred to OR custody right away, being placed in removal proceedings where they can fully seek relief before an immigration judge, instead they say that all children must be screened within seven days of entering the United States. And if the judge doesn't determine, determine they're eligible for any relief, then they have to be returned unless they have an asylum claim. And if they have an asylum claim, then they can talk to an asylum officer for an initial screening, not an asylum interview. And if the asylum officer and immigration judge say no asylum, they have to go home right away. Now the problem with this is that children do not have the right to appointed counsel. Um, so this screening, this expedited processing of children, would occur within weeks, maybe days. 
cities when it's how across the border, um, probably still very self-taught from the experience they came from, with no family or guardian to assist them through the process, no attorney to represent them or tell them what evidence they need to tell the judge, what the standards are, what information must be told to the adjudicator to seek relief. Um, and they are expected to provide evidence to support their case in order to meet a fairly high burden to establish that they may be eligible for relief so that they then can come into the U.S. for a full process before an immigration judge. So this is incredibly problematic. Um, we, and we'll talk more about working with children in a, in a few moments, but when we see these children at the shelters, we often don't even meet with them for several days until after they arrive because they are in no condition to retain information or to explain anything about what they've been through in their home country. Um, and of course, these are children who often would need to reveal very um, intimate information about some of the most traumatic incidents in their history to an adjudicator who is prosecuting them um, within a very short period of time. So right now, um, you know, Congress is on recess, but these are very problematic things that have been trying to be pushed through um, through Congress at this time. So one of the questions that we often um, get asked about the children is, is how they get here and how they really come all the way to Chicago. People think that this immigration problem is at the border, and why are these children here in Chicago? Um, so a common story, for example, is our uh, girl that we had screened at one of the shelters here named Daniela, who was 16 years old and came from El Salvador. Um, her father had abandoned her and her mother when she was very young, um, had very little presence in her life. When she would have contact with them, he was very frequently verbally abusive. He would call her a dog for only having a mother and no father, and really had no presence in her life whatsoever. Um, in 2013, um, some gangs began to extort her on her way to different school every day. They would demand that she would pay money, and if she couldn't pay them, they said they would kill her. Um, they knew her mother lived in the United States, and so they knew they believed she had money for that reason. And so they were trying to extort her. When she told them they could not pay, they repeatedly threatened to kill her to the point that she felt she could no longer safely attend school. At that point, she, she felt like she really had no, well, no life in El Salvador. There was nothing for her there. She couldn't go to school. She couldn't leave her house. She was basically living in hiding because if she left her home, she was she feared that the gang would kill her. So um, she was able to obtain a smuggler, a coyote, who took her all the way up through Mexico. Um, she was fortunate in that she was able to avoid going on the train. Many of the children who come here travel up on the top of trains going through Mexico. It's incredibly dangerous. Many children um, and many adults who travel on the train lose limbs, they're killed, they're attacked by cartels and gangs along the route. Um, but she was able to avoid that and took buses and cars for the most part um, and, until she walked up to the border. When she got to the border, she turned herself into um, Customs and Border Protection. She, like many of the children we see, thought at that point that she would be safe. She was in the United States. Unfortunately, she was held in, um, in Customs and Border Protection in custody in a short-term holding facility for four days. Um, during this time, the lights were kept on all hours of the day, so she couldn't sleep, and it was kept in very, very cold temperatures. The children often refer to these places as tea boxes because they're so cold. Um, she could not eat the food. She could not keep it down, um, and so um, she had very little to eat. One of the officers there would regularly um, come in the middle of the night to wake up the children and yell that they had to wake up. And as they were getting ready to get on the plane to come to Chicago so she could be in a shelter here, um, keeping in mind that none of these children have ever been on a plane before, the officer told her and some of the other children that, that he hoped her plane would crash. And if it crashed, it would be the happiest day of his life. Um, so the experience in, in uh, her first experience with immigration authority here in the United States was very terrifying. Um, fortunately, she was brought here to a shelter in Chicago, and she subsequently was able to reunite with her mother and was able to begin to recover from the but as you can see for many of these children, they get to the border, but their, their, their journey doesn't really end at that point. It's really the first part of a whole new process that they're going through. So this is the typical process we've been talking about. So they go to DHS custody, again, it's supposed to be 72 hours, but it's often longer. They're transferred to the Office of Refugee Resettlement Custody. And at that point, they really have two different paths that they're going through. On the one hand, Office of Refugee Resettlement is working to find a family who they can be released to or be united with. If it's just a parent or an immediate relative of some sort. At the same time that the child is going on the family release route, the child is already in removal proceedings in the immigration court. The Department of Homeland Security is actively trying to deport them, although they don't have the right to an appointed attorney. Um, so they are in immigration court, and at the same time, they are receiving legal services while they are detained. These legal services are incredibly important because many of these children are going to be released and never really had a chance to find an attorney once they're released because they are being released to a place 
where there are no legal services, it's not a metropolitan area, or maybe they are released to a metropolitan area, but the legal services there are completely overwhelmed. So the legal services that the children receive while the independent are incredibly important. So the Office of Refugee Resettlement, in addition to running the shelters, also contracts out to local um, NGOs to provide legal services for unaccompanied children. So NIJC is contracted or a subcontractor of ORR to provide legal services to the children while they are detained. And this happens throughout the entire United States. Unfortunately, because of the way that the, the contract is in the government funding and appropriation, um, those services are limited exclusively to detained children. So although NIJC is able to serve relief children through other funding, the funding we receive to serve the detained children ends when they are released. And we'll turn it over to what NIJC does at this point. Okay. NIJC's children's project, um, and, and sometimes I even lose count of how many of us are on the team because we've been going really quickly to address this problem. Um, right now we are 10 paralegals, three staff attorneys, a supervisor, and a managing attorney, and our associate director of legal services also helps to manage the project. Um, so we're a pretty big team, and we're actually the largest team at NIJC right now. A few months ago, we had a team retreat, and we came together to come up with a mission and a vision for our team that goes beyond just the details of the, the operational aspect of our work, which is providing legal services to children that are in the custody of, of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, so our vision is for every young immigrant, an attorney, knowledge, and the opportunity to be a kid. And our mission is to empower young immigrants to seek justice and make informed decisions. And we try to remain attentive of, of this vision um, when we provide legal services, and especially in the face of so many challenges with, with such high numbers in recent months. Um, so our staff goes to, uh, there's a network of shelters throughout the Chicagoland area. And we do site visits, one each paralegal and or staff attorney goes one to two times a week um, to provide children with Know Your Rights presentations and legal screenings. Um, Kathleen will be discussing the Know Your Rights presentations in a bit more detail in the next section. Um, the individual screening can run from anywhere to 20 to 30, usually about 30 minutes to an hour to two hours, depending on how complicated the child's case is depending how much trauma um, they need to discuss in terms of why they decided and why their family decided to come to the United States. Based on that legal screening, we come to a legal relief determination. Um, and based on that, help the children, help guide the children towards their next step. So in some cases, we will make a direct referral. There's so few of the children that we see in the shelter stay in the Chicago area. We feel like one of the most important aspects of our work is coming to a release determination for each child's case and then helping them find the legal resources they need wherever it is that they're unified with their family or with their sponsor to make sure that they can follow through with their, with their case and um, have a positive legal outcome. Um, not all children have access to a sponsor. And in those cases, we help to guide those children towards long-term foster care. Um, so that's a, a separate process, and, and that's also um, the, the, the long-term foster care system is mostly outside of the Chicago area. So there are three beds, uh, three individuals that we can serve at any given time um, for long-term foster care. Uh, so these are the numbers that, uh, of services that we've provided this year. And so far through June 2014, we've already served 2,900. So we're seeing double the numbers that we did last year. Um, currently there, are, as I mentioned earlier, there's capacity for 500 children in the Chicagoland area. Um, Chicago 
has unique resources in terms of language, especially that are not available to children in some of the other shelter networks throughout the country. Um, and so we also see, in addition to the Central American kids, some pretty unique population of children from, um, and by unique, I mean, these are really small numbers in terms of the total numbers of kids that are coming into the United States with UICs. So we do see a percentage of children from China, some from looking increasing numbers of children from Nigeria and Ghana and certain parts of Somalia, parts of Africa, um, as well as children from Bangladesh and India. So again, some of the, the demographic makeup of the children that we see, um, the, the majority of the children that we work with is Spanish, but among the Guatemalan that, that, that come through, they, there are a number of Mayan indigenous languages that are some easy to find the interpreter for, and then in some cases can be really difficult um, because those languages are spoken by such few, so few people. Um, we do have Mandarin capacity on staff. One of our paralegals speaks Mandarin, so that is, that's helpful for working with the Chinese kids. Um, and then in terms of the ages of the children that we see, most of them are um, over 14, but we've seen over the past year, in addition to a pretty intense increase in the number of girls, a huge increase in the number of young children. And the shelter system in Chicago has adapted to be able to receive those children as well because they need special um, shelter conditions. So the actually have seen this year we've seen double the number of, of children we call them tender age when they're under the age of, of 14. Um, so what happens to the children when they are released? This is a question that um, we have some information about um, and we wish that we had more because it's really hard to keep track of where the children go and what kind of services they receive um, when they're reunified with their family. Um, after the children are released, we get an address for them from the shelter where they were um, where, where they were detained while they were waiting for the reunification process to be completed. Um, and we send them all a closing packet. So we this got information about what they should do now that they're released, um, how to get legal services, and, and a little bit about their rights in general, if they're going to work, what they need to look out for, if they're being harmed, who they should call. Um, and, and a fair number of those packets actually have access to return mail. Um, so we continue to try and follow up with those children to um, ensure that they have the knowledge to access the legal resources that they need. Um, this, there's some new data that came out recently that showed that 90% of children who appear in court without representation were ordered, deported, or granted voluntary departure. Um, whereas when the children had an attorney, um, about half were granted some sort of legal status here in the United States. And so, if there's one thing that we really hope that the children take away from their interactions with NIJC is that they have to get um, representation for their removal proceedings once they're released. And any opportunity we have to speak with their families, we also really emphasize the importance of that. The NIJC also provides services to children that are released through two of our other programs. Um, immigrant Legal Defense Project provides representation legal services in-house and control of attorneys for sailing petitions, removal proceedings, special immigrant juvenile status, um, which we'll discuss in more detail, um, trafficking and so T visas for trafficking and U visas for victims of crime, um, violence against women file petitions, uh, prosecutorial discretion, and deferred action for child trial. Um, prosecutorial discretion is one form of relief that doesn't necessarily grant children long-term status here in the United States, but we do see a lot of children that are eligible to have their removal proceedings closed because their families are already living here, their parents might have U.S.-born children, um, and so we have also been advocating that these children's cases, their removal proceedings be closed um, based on prosecutorial. And the asylum project, as um, Ashley mentioned earlier, also takes cases for UIC.
seen here in shelters are released elsewhere. So their shelter location is in no way related to the place they're going to be ultimately released. Most children we see are released in New York, or Louisiana, North Carolina, California, Texas, and other places. So um, we'll be talking more about pro bono opportunities related to children as we get further on, but I think the, the release location is something important to keep in mind. The other thing I neglected to say earlier on is um, you know, we, we decided to hold this training because we were receiving so many questions at NIJC about what's going on with this children and how I can help. Um, you're all very quiet groups today, but we encourage you to uh, speak up and ask any questions that you have. If you have any questions about um, the background that we just talked about, about why the children are here and what happens when they arrive, or moving further on, if you have questions about any of the, the types of opportunities we'll be discussing, or if you have a case yourself and you have a question, please don't hesitate to ask. Kathleen now is going to talk specifically about some practice pointers on working with children, and then our first pro bono opportunity, which is doing Know Your Rights presentation um, for the children who are detained in the shelter that if you're a bilingual Spanish. So again, please don't hesitate to have any questions. And we have it right away. You have to mute your microphone so that people can hear you on that webinar. Yes, yeah, so when we're talking about children being released, we mean they are being released from the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So they come in to CDC. organizations and others who track these sorts of things are only starting to track the statistics related 
that's a different situation. So these children, when we're talking about unaccompanied children, we're talking about children that arrive without parents. They are placed in shelters on their own because they're unaccompanied. Um, children who arrive with parents are accompanied children, and their treatment is very different. Um, there is no set standard for their treatment, and they are typically treated in the same way that their parents with whom they are with is being treated. So you may have seen in the news right now that the administration has dramatically increased the number of family detention facilities, which is never has really happened um, for many, many years, and it's a, a fairly disturbing phenomenon. Um, we have a new facility in our city in Mexico, which is uh, somewhat in the middle of nowhere, and another facility in Carnes in Texas. Um, and these facilities are holding hundreds of parents and children, and from what we've seen, they are not being granted bonds, and they are being deployed very quickly. Okay. I think it's all right. Okay. So my name is Kathleen, and um, I'm a fairly well the kids project. For these next two sections, I'll be talking to you about some best practices of working with immigrant children, and then um, I'll talk about honorary rights presentations that we give to children while they're detained at shelters here in Chicago. Um, so some general practice corners. The most important thing when working with children is to um, be sensitive and be flexible. Working with children, especially unaccompanied children, um, it's very different than working with adults. Children are not used to working within formal systems of, I have a paralegal, I'm going to interview you. Um, so you really need to make a kid-friendly environment. And we're going to walk through some ways to make um, intakes and interact with immigrant children more kid-friendly. Explain um, your role. Explain who you are. I'm a lawyer. A lawyer is someone who knows the law, and I practice the law, and I can help you win your case. Um, explain their role. You are, you're here. So we're going to try to deport you, um, and we're going to try to fight to win your case. So being very clear with children and slowing things down is very important. Um, to create a safe feeling environment for this child, we'll go into a little bit more about what a safe environment can look like. And using child-friendly terminology, um, these unaccompanied children are not familiar with a lot of big legal terms. Um, and so breaking terms down is really important. One that we always break down is confidentiality. Um, we like to tell the kids that it's like a secret just between me and you, and I will not tell anyone what you tell me without your permission. Um, that makes them feel a little safer. Um, when children receive their... Excuse me? Oh, yep. Is that better for everyone? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so another important thing is to... Um, Use child-friendly terminology, like I was saying. So when children um, receive their notice to appear, they also receive what is known as an A number, which is their identification number with immigration. Um, many times, children don't even know what identification number means. So we even have to break that down even farther and say, it's like your personal code. Um, there might be many Kathleen's in the system, and the government wants to know that they're talking to the right Kathleen. So this is a special number just for you. Um, so yeah, little things that you might not think of kids still need some help wrapping up those concepts in their mind. And also it's very important, children aim to please. So whenever you can, using how or why questions as opposed to yes or no questions is always important. For example, we often ask children about their relationship with their parents. Um, so instead of saying, so you got along with your mother, right? Um, you should try and ask them, how was your relationship with your mom? And open up that space for them to talk to you as opposed to just answering yes or no. Um, building up your rapport with the child is very important. Um, using icebreakers is a great way to get kids to feel comfortable with your presence there and working with them. Um, I've used icebreakers of all sorts. So when it's snowing outside, this is the first time many kids have ever seen snow in their life. So it's a great way to say, you believe all that snow on the ground? And it just if you can get the kid to laugh with you before you sort of delve into more serious things, they're more likely to trust you. Um, I've talked to children about pizza. I've talked to them about the street cleaners that they see going outside these buildings, and they've never seen these machines before, soccer, the World Cup. So anything that can pop into your mind that's sort of a chit-chatty small talk, is, it goes a long way. Next one. And so always be relaxed with them. It's very good. Um, and also assessing for the children's comprehension level. Um, you're working with children that are coming from different countries, and the educational systems are different, and sometimes these children have had access to formal education. So um, sometimes it's just important to their understanding.
understanding what you're saying. And so building a little comprehension check along the way when you're working with children is very important. Um, even just asking them to repeat back what you just said to them is a great way to make sure that you're connecting with the child. And also always giving children clear establishments. This is what we're going to talk about now. This is what we're going to talk about next. This is what we're going to talk about at the end. So that they know what to expect and what's coming up. So nothing is really a surprise to them during these uh, appointments when you be talking with them. And so when you first meet with the child, um, take easy questions first. What was your name? What's your mother's name? When was your birthday? And then um, consistently delve into those more um, detailed or tougher questions. And if a child needs not to understand, repeat your question in a different way. Like yesterday, I was working with a, with a child, and I asked him, do you practice any religion? And he said, what does that mean? And so I said, do you go to church with your family? He goes, oh, yes, I'm Catholic. We go every week. So sometimes just flipping things around helps kids um, comprehend what you're trying to ask them. And also being an active listener. The child knows that you're engaging with them, and that you're interested in what they're saying. So something that I always do is, so you point out your mom, and that you have a good relationship with her. Now let's talk about your dad. And so just repeating back so the child knows you understand what you're coming from. And be aware of your eye contact. Um, try and a lot of times I think we work with computers, which can be a little disengaging while necessary. So always taking the time to look up, look at the child when you're talking to the child. And keep the conversation at the pace of the child. Many times um, you get kids who are, you know, they're this tall, they're really small, and they're really shy. And you sort of you have to wait and let them talk and give them their space to talk. Um, other times you get kids who are little better boxes, and so you got to keep up with them and sort of crawl them in. So just adjusting for who you're with. And when you're concluding the meeting, it's always great to um, highlight the more important parts of what you talked about. So when we talk with children, some of the most important things that we talk about is being sure that you find an attorney, that you go to your court date, that you call all the courts to see when your court date is, and just really driving home the most important point. Because um, when we work with children in the detained context, they're getting information from this person over here and this person over here, and it's, it's a very confusing system for them to work with. So if you can send kids home with sort of a couple of takeaways to help them draft concepts. And always allow time and allow space for questions. And be clear with next step, how, what your next interaction is going to do with that child. And also a responsibility. So I think it's all about breaking it down. Um, so sometimes working with children doesn't go so smoothly. And we tend to work with children who have experienced a lot of trauma um, in their home countries and in the US. And so um, sometimes you get a lot of, I don't remember, or I don't know to a lot of questions. And sometimes it might be that they, they really don't remember, but other times um, it might be that you need to work a little bit harder to withdraw some information from the kids. So um, a lot of times when we're asking children, how old were you when your mother left to the United States, or how old were you when something happened, um, they go, I don't remember. So you can rephrase it and say, do you remember what grade you were in school? Like what was going on in your life at that time? Um, and also, a great thing to do is if you just have a pen at your desk and some paper, you can ask the child if they would like to draw while you're talking. It's very young. And um, this sometimes helps them just to disconnect and to be distracted. You can also ask them to draw a picture of the people they live with in their house. And so then you sort of get the family dynamic. I believe that they were living with an uncle, so you sort of can piece together their story by asking them to draw it for you instead of speaking. Um, as we said, ask questions in a different way, and sometimes breaking down questions. So if a child tells you, I was threatened by gangs, and I was very scared, and I stopped going to school, and then you can pull out more information by breaking it down and saying, all right, what gang was that? Remember, was it when you were on your way to school, when you were going home from school? So you can help the child tell their story by um, trying to pull out more specific things, still without being and there's always you can move on to questions and come back later. If you can, you think a child is very upset, you just let it sit, and maybe things are less intense at a different time of your intake, you can come back and ask that question. And you can always remind children that you're there to help. 
I think that goes back to defining roles for children that we are not the government, right? We are not here to judge you or to make you feel that. We need to know this information so that we can help you in the best way possible. Um, because children, they're interacting with OR staff, they still interact with CDC staff, and then we come in and we're sort of a, we're a different role and constantly reminding that child of that role can sometimes help them open up. So a little bit about what a Know Your Rights presentation is. Um, and at the end of this, so if, and maybe I'm getting ahead of this about about when we actually get pro bono cases from this, but any child that we're talking to that we're interviewing, you will have screened already, right? I mean, so it's not there's you already think that there that there is something there. Yes. So what what exactly will you have done? Well, so it's so two things. So this is the first pro bono opportunity we're going to talk about today. There's no your rights opportunity, which is different from some of the normal opportunities we offer. Most of our pro bono are cases. You come in and you represent a client in a case and you to the beginning to the end. Um, this is an opportunity to provide Know Your Rights presentations to children while they are detained. So this is a discrete opportunity. It does not involve representation. It is notifying the children of their rights in the shelter. So um, in, as, as Tessie will talk about, in the Know Your Rights presentation, you are the first person who actually be speaking to them from a legal perspective. And I think you will come in after and do a legal screening with them. So this is a little bit different. For all other opportunities, though, it goes back to what we initially talked about about NIJC's pro bono program. So if you take an asylum case for, from us, or a special interview juvenile case or some other case, NIJC has already screened the case. We've sent you a case summary that explains what this case is about. That all being said, you still need to identify yourself to the, the child and explain your role. And I think with children, like that being said, reminding them again and again and again about who you are, why you are helping them, what you are doing. Because again, remember, a lot of these kids are coming from environments where you don't trust somebody. But when children say, oh, you don't trust authority figures to begin with. But when they're coming from some of these environments, they definitely don't trust authority figures. They don't trust the, the judicial system. They don't trust the judge or a police officer. So you need to explain what you're doing, why you're there, and how you're going to be able to help them, even though NJC has got to do that with them from the beginning. So when you have these meetings, uh, where do they take place? Because I know normally our clients, for the asylum cases, they just meet us at our office, but I'm kind of picturing this little kid walking around downtown Chicago and just wondering, like, do we meet them with their parents at our office or do we go to their, you know, the shelter or wherever they're staying? Okay, most of our children opportunities, aside from this one, are going to be for non-detained children because the children are released very quickly. The majority of children are released within about a month or so and about almost half of the children are being released within about three to four weeks. So when if any of our pro bono opportunities involving asylum cases and those cases, they're all being released children. So you will not typically be representing a child who is detained. For the released children, we uh, would recommend you treat it like you just have like any other client, although you obviously have to make, make certain accommodations because of their age. So some of our clients who are 16 or 17, depending on where they live, they may take the L to our office by themselves or you know the, the metro or whatever. It depends on their situation. The other children, of course, are going to come with a family member or guardian of some sort. Um, the older children may as well. Um, depending on the age of the child, like was mentioned on the previous slide, though, we do recommend that you keep that family member out of the, the meeting, except for some initial introductions, because um, there may be information that the child is not comfortable telling in front of a parent or another family member. Of course, the younger children in different situations as well. But isn't it also a good example that um, if they come with, a, if they're, they're with a parent, you also mean that the parent may be separate from the child because the parent can add details, perhaps that the child doesn't understand or relevant. Yeah, potentially, if the child gives you permission to reveal information, then that's the case with the parent. Because again, even though these are children, we do want to. It's even more important in some cases to really emphasize how confidentiality applies, and that you won't even tell anything they tell you to the parent unless they give you permission to do so. But yes, in many cases, you would also want to get an affidavit help corroborate the case as well. So um, as with all of our pro bono opportunities at NIJC, most of our clients will require interpreters, and that is something that the, the pro bono attorney is responsible for obtaining. Um, we do maintain a list of volunteer interpreters who may be available to assist you, but if not, that is, again, the responsibility of the pro bono attorney. Um, I'll 
in even more details about how, how this actually takes place. Aside from the KYR, are there any other questions right now? There, is there any kind of a fitness evaluation if the child hears out their parent and if they're going to be released to, let's say, a distant family member, um, would they be evaluated for fitness at all, or is this just, just because they're family they would be released to them? No, there is a, and again, this is something that the Office of Refugee Resettlement handles, so this is not something that would go through NIJT in any way, but the Office of Refugee Resettlement does have procedures by which they evaluate whether a child can be released to a certain individual, whether it's a parent or um, if the um, child brings that to our attention during the representation, we would just redirect it to the office, the office of refugee resettlement. So, um, so again, just to clarify, with the detained children versus non-detained children. So, if you're doing a know your rights presentation, you're providing general information to groups of children. Um, you're, you're not providing individual information that will happen with it. And if the consultation with the individual child. If you're meeting with a released child and ORR is no longer involved whatsoever, the child has been released, the child is no longer in custody. If the child raises concerns to you about their guardian, um, this is an NIJC pro bono case, and we would probably encourage you to get in touch with us as soon as possible so we can discuss both the situation with the child and how this impacts the child's Any other questions? Okay, thank you so much. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the Know Your Rights presentations um, and how we work with children in groups because we get these presentations as children come into the shelter. So depending on the week, the group can range anywhere from only about three kids, so to 16, 20 kids. Um, we just we go in once a week, and you know, every kid that arrives the last time we were there gets a presentation. So we generally talk to children within the first uh, 72, three, four days that they're here. Um, and so we talk to the, to the detained children about their legal rights um, and their responsibilities now that they're here in the U.S. Um, many times we as staff are the first people to tell children that they are going to have court here in the United States. Um, we really are the role that empower the children and let them know really what is happening to them. Um, we're the first ones that talk to them about court and inform them about court and their rights. And Many times for the children, it's a very empowering process. They leave, those, they leave our presentation much, with much more information than they started. Um, and so, what is in a KYR presentation? So, one of the important things is that shelter placement is not based on the child's reunification. So that means that we only have a very short amount of time to give children this information because they may be released to places like Alabama or Kansas or Mississippi where Legal services are very, um, very limited. Um, and as we saw, children who have representation are more likely to win their court cases, as Molly talked about. And we've seen that children who receive our presentations are more likely to seek out those services once they are released. Yep. Who are the sponsors in the first bullet point? Uh, so the sponsors are their family members that they're related to. So it could be the mom, the dad, the cousin, family friend. Um, so the topics that we cover in our KYR are, are we really um, we emphasize to the children who we are, and sometimes we do that by saying who we are not. Um, so this is to find ourselves in the negative. We always tell the children we are not the government. We do not work for the court, and we do not work for the shelter. So that everything you tell us is that confidential, it's that secret. Um, and that our only job is to help you and inform you about your legal rights and how you can win your case. Um, and that makes kids feel more at home. Um, we also have to differentiate between their legal case and their family case. Um, it's most popular questions tend to be, how long am I going to be at this shelter? When can I call my mom? And so we repeatedly have to emphasize, unfortunately, we do not know the answers to those questions because we do not work here. Um, so we always discuss the confidentiality and who we are. And then we do a brief overview of the legal system. And we do this by um, using a metaphor where we say that um, the court system is like a soccer game. And we put it in terms the child can understand. So we say there are two teams. There's you on one team, and then there's immigration on the other team. And each court, um, each state at court is like a game. And then we make the analogy that the referee is exactly like the judge and that your coaches are your lawyers. 
and these are the people that are going to fight for you and help you win your case. And that um, definitely puts the court setting more on the kids, the kids' level, on the level that they can easily understand because all kids have those kids on there. They're all very familiar with it. Um, we also try and explain why they're at these shelters or what has happened to make them go through this legal process. And sometimes we um, we compare it to being an uninvited guest in someone's house. And then that's why the government is trying to keep you out because it's like you enter your house without asking for permission. Um, so it's really about breaking things down. We talk to them about how they could win their case, how they could lose their case, um, what sort of impact the deportation order has. Uh, sometimes we have children who are interested in taking voluntary departure and we explain that. Um, we briefly talk to them about their legal their, their rights while they're at the shelter and then also their rights once they are released. We check in with them, we see how everything's going at the shelter, and we talk to them about next steps because once they receive their presentation, um, we will talk to them and do an individual legal screening with them. And the most important point that we stress during these presentations is that you must find your own lawyer, that no one is going to give you a lawyer, and the importance of going to court and not making any court dates or to avoid an you know, unfair court. That's the basic structure of our presentation. Yes. Talk about the logistics of this process for a minute. And again, the question came up: Where does this happen? Where do these know your rights presentations take place? Who organizes them? How does it yeah. get organized? So the children are in very um, in their OR shelters, which are very kid-friendly shelters. You go in, and it kind of looks like a like a residential home or residential school. While well, the children are in OR custody, they go to classes all day. They have bedrooms with bunk beds, there are foosball tables, and there are lounges. So we, as um, legal service providers, get a list of all the new kids that come in from the Office of Refugee Resettlement. And then we track who has received a notary registration and who has not. So when we go into the shelters, we have a lounge every day that we sit in. And so we have our list of children that we need to give a presentation to, and we go pull them out of their classroom and we present them. So the, you know, we're talking about pro bono opportunity today. What's unique about this particular training is normally NIJC's pro bono trainings are in-depth substantive trainings on a particular legal topic related to a type of relief, so asylum, for example, or a visa. The goal of this, this presentation today is to provide an overview of the current situation regarding unaccompanied children and different ways you can get involved. This is not going to provide a substantive in-depth uh, presentation on different types of, of ways you can get involved and different types of relief. So at the end of this um, simple presentation today, if you are interested in getting involved in providing your rights presentations, and if you're bilingual and speak Spanish, um, then you can reach out to us and we'll provide you more and much more information on, on how to do the presentation, the logistics of the presentation, we have a script for these presentations, it's all um, very nicely tied up in a bow for you, so it's very easy to get involved. So the goal today is to provide an overview of different ways that you can get involved. Just on the information point, um, have you found that kids when you're explaining the rights to them, that they already believe that they're eligible for relief under DACA or? Um, yeah, what we find is that kids do not know about the U.S. legal system. So no, they're, not at, they're not at home looking up DACA requirements. Um, usually very, kids have very little knowledge of our U.S. legal system. And I think it's going to be one one missed uh, piece yeah. of information that's been put out in, in the media by some Group, which is that you know, these children are coming because they think there's going to be amnesty and they think they're eligible for some sort of amnesty program. And we actually ask the children, we say, did you, did you hear about anything before you came here? What, what made you come to the United States? Have you heard about any legal options for you? And they haven't heard about any of it. Most of them have never even heard about asylum or any other forms of relief. They came because they were desperate, they needed to flee for their lives, they had no one else to take care of them in their home country, and this is the only option for them. Yes, Spanish in Brought in later, so for Know Your Rights presentations, because of the time limit and the, the number of children to serve, um, it is only for people who are bilingual. Well the presentation, is there any like, screening or specific space for children? The question was in addition to the KYF presentation, is there an additional screening? And yes. Yeah. So what happens is the children all receive a Know Your Rights presentation first, and then NIJC conducts individual legal screenings with each child. Um, we do not use pro bono opportunities for that because, again, of the speed in which things need to move, um, we, we have to move quickly with each child quickly before they're released. 
Uh, but that does happen. So if you would be doing it on your rights presentation and you get some specific questions about you know, a particular child's case, you can feel confident in referring that they will speak to an NIJC staff member and they will be able to answer all their questions. All right. So some important things to keep in mind um, while you're giving a your rights presentation is that many of these children just arrived, as we've been talking about, and they've been working with all these government officials. Some have been adversarial at the border, others have been a friendly face at the at the shelters, but um, it's always important to reinforce who you are because a lot for a lot of these kids this has just been a whirlwind experience. So slowing things down and breaking it down so that they know who we are. Um, and also, retaining information for these children is going to be difficult um, because, as I just said, right, this has been a whirlwind experience for them. So, always breaking it down and keeping it slow and at their pace. Um, because when you're more worried about, I only talk to my mother for 10, 10 minutes a week, um, that's going to be the number one thing on a child's mind is usually my parents, my safety. Um, so, that's also why it's important to create this safe environment to sort of help kids be in the moment and just listen to what you're saying so that they can help retain this information for themselves. Um, and they might have just a lack of experience with any sort of system. Um, so these children, if they're coming from more rural backgrounds, may have had very few years of formal education. And just the idea that there are sort of these invisible structures in place that um, a lot of us have been socialized into, these children have not. So you really have to break things down. I've had kids ask me, so what is court? Where is court? And you have to even say, like, it's a building. And you go into the building, and there will be a judge in front of you. So even just the concept of what is going to court even on a very practical level. And always, like I said, small talk. Um, we always look at a map with the children and we talk about um, where they are in the United States. Many of them are not quite sure where they are. Um, and I always like to ask them where their family is, if they know. And that's a great moment to connect with kids and sort of have a nice relaxed uh, moment. Like if children are going to New York, I always say, Oh, New York City is the Big Apple, or if you're going to Maryland, I'm like, well, I hope you like crabs, but there's really great crabs in Maryland. Just little, little silly small pot items really uh, make kids happy. And it's an easy way to connect with them. Uh, and also checking for comprehension. As we said, um, some of the children who come from Guatemala are primarily indigenous languages. Um, and sometimes there can be many negative social stereotypes around that. So I would like to approach that by saying, Spanish is not my first language. Is it not? Is it anyone else's second language too? Is there another language that you feel more comfortable speaking? Um, and sometimes kids will volunteer that information. Sometimes other kids in the group will say, "Oh, he speaks loud. Oh, he speaks." So it's always good to know at the end because we do go back with interpreters and speak with children um, in their preferred language after the QIR. So we give them a one-on-one -on -one sort of overview of what we talked about to make sure that. We are communicating in the child's best language so that they get the best service possible. And as always, repeat the remarks. And one of the most important things is that the child feels ownership over their case. Um, even though these children are young, as young as eight, six years old, um, it is still their case. It's not their brother's case, it's not their mother's case not their uncle's case, it's that child's case, and giving them that feeling of empowerment is something that we always try to do during our presentation. Um, to tell them, your mom can help you find this, your mom can help you find an attorney, but um, you need to push your mom to help you do these things because it's your case. And we always have, um, we always give the child a manual that has all the basic points that we talked about during the presentation. And at the back of that manual, there's also a list organized by each state in the U.S. of free or low-cost attorneys that can help them. It's in Spanish, yes. It's in Spanish, English, Mandarin. We have a bunch of a bunch of different um, languages. So at the back of that list, um, we always point out to the children that there's this list of attorneys because when you leave this center, no one is going to give you an attorney. So we provide them with resources and a place to start. Our website is also on there. And so the manual comes um, full with resources for the child. And always give opportunities to ask them questions or have them ask you questions. Um, because many times you may not even realize that they don't understand what you're saying. 
which is also why it's great to build in comprehension checks throughout your presentation. Um, sometimes you talk about the course section, and I always like to ask, can someone here explain to the group what we just talked about, or what's an important point that you remember from this section? It's great to, it's a great way to have the kids start talking and have them feel comfortable, and um, sometimes it's easier to retain information if you hear it from your peers. And so we always remind them at the end that after the presentation, they will have an individual screening and an individual intake system. So keep it engaging, try to keep as light as possible because sometimes we're talking about very heavy topics, but um, the more, more you can do to make the child feel at home, the better your presentation will be. So we, um, so we are just here um, in the back. She's one of our pro bono attorneys who does know your rights presentation. Um, to just speak very briefly on, on her experiences as a pro bono attorney doing know your rights presentations and some practice budget that she's developed. Um, you're welcome to come up here. Or you can... I'll just stay back here. Okay. Um, I've been doing the KYRs for about six months now. And I think the most important thing to remember if that's what you're, how you're going to get involved is to both be flexible just because, like I mentioned earlier, sometimes you go in on a Wednesday morning and you're presenting to three children, you know, three girls. Other times you go in and you're presenting to 15 boys, ranged in ages, you know. So just be flexible going in. You're really there to help the NIGC staff to free them up to meet with these kids one-on-one -on -one to, you know, take the intake and figure out exactly what the NIGC can do to help them. And the other thing would be to not get discouraged like was also mentioned earlier, by the time you see these kids, they see maybe, you know, many different adults from different agencies giving them much, like, a lot of information that, you know, is hard for an adult to comprehend, let alone a child. So if you're giving the presentation and you see a bunch of, like, glazed over looks, you know, just stop maybe, you know, break the ice somehow and make sure that everyone's understanding or at least paying attention and reminding them that the manual that they get at the end has all the information that you've just covered so they can go back afterwards and, you know, um, look, look through it and then also share it with whoever their sponsor is that they get released to so that that person can also help them. Um, practical notes, bring pens, many pens, because at the end of the presentation, all the kids are going to have to sign, um, sign two forms indicating that they received the the presentation and you know if you have many pens will go faster um, and then again just hammer home that it's their responsibility you know some of these kids are really really young and they you know by all accounts they shouldn't be facing this enormous legal process um, but they are so just hammer home that it's their responsibility to find an attorney and to find a good attorney not um, an Ofadio which unfortunately is very common um, and you know then IJC does a good job of giving them a list of resources once they get out by state. But, you know, just letting them know that they need to take that upon themselves to find an attorney and go to court because if they don't, then that's their one opportunity that it was, you know, I repeat to them that mostly throughout the presentation that they have to go to court and if they don't, like, they, they automatically lose. Just like if you were at a soccer game. If you don't show up to the game, automatically their team wins. There's no do-overs even if you're a child. Um, other than that, I would encourage you, if you are bilingual and able to take the time to get involved with KRIR, it's not a big time commitment at all, I think. You only have two presentations a month, and they're usually in the mornings, and you can be in and out by about 10.30, like back at home or at your office at 10.30 if you're only doing one. So I don't think it's a big time commitment, and it really does help children and NIJC freeing them up to you know, do other more in-depth things that only they can do with the kids. Thank you so much. Does, does anyone have any questions um, for Kathleen or for Zomira? So, so yeah, the Office of Refugee Resettlement contacts out to legal to they contact out to the Vera Institute in New York, who helps contract out to legal service providers to provide certain legal services to children while they're detained. And part of that contract is to provide other rights for the and the inmates. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, this is an yeah, oh, yeah. 
Um, does the uh, presentation have to be made by a lawyer? Um, because in my office, I've got any speaking paralegals and administrative assistants too. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be by an attorney, but um, for pro bono purposes, if it's a non-attorney, we'd recommend that you have an attorney for the paralegal for the presentation. Um, just to make sure that um, you know proper information is being provided and um, the legal information that's being given. So if anyone is interested in this particular opportunity, we'll provide more information at the end about how you can get involved, and we'll also be sticking around at the end for anybody who has any questions. Um, we're not too far running late off the agenda, so we'll take a quick, uh, very quick 10-minute break, um, get some refreshments, and then we'll start back up discussing the rest of the time with the other pro bono opportunities that are available. <laughs> All right, we're going to get started so we can try to, try to keep on track here. So the next promotional opportunity we're going to talk about, and moving forward, these opportunities are going to be the case opportunities. So the Know Your Rights presentation is a much more discreet, individual um, opportunity, and now we're going to talk about um, representing um, children and other um, immigrants in cases. So the first type of, of relief we're going to talk about is special immigrant juvenile status. So what is, so this is called SIJF or SIG often. Um, and so what is it? So this is a form of group that was created to specifically protect and provide status for certain vulnerable immigrant children here in the United States. Like many of the forms of relief we're talking about, it's an initial form of relief that leads to other more permanent relief. So the municipal immigrant juvenile status that leads to permanent residency or green card and can eventually lead to citizenship. Um, it's available as a form of relief for both accompanied and unaccompanied children. So children who just entered the United States as unaccompanied children are eligible to seek this. Children who entered with a parent when they were two years old and have been here for 10 years are also eligible to seek this form of relief. What's really significant about SIJF compared to nearly all other forms of immigration relief is children who obtain SIJF are not able to petition for their parents in the future. So technically, if you become a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident, you can file a petition for your parents to come here to the United States to join you. Because of this particular form of relief, children who get this form of relief cannot do that. For some children, that is reason enough not to want to seek this form of relief. So, for example, um, some years ago, we, were, we had intake a child from Somalia who did not he had lost contact with both of his parents. And, and during the time of war, he had fled the country. He hadn't seen them in five years. But he still held out hope that he would be able to connect with them in the future. And for that reason, he decided that he did not want to actually pursue this particular form of relief. So how do you establish your eligibility for SIJS? This is a, another unique part of SIJS. There is a two-part process, which is why Elizabeth is here to talk as well. There's a state court process and an immigration process. To be eligible for SIJS, you have to meet these criteria. So you first have to establish, you have to establish that you have been, the child has been declared dependent on a juvenile court or committed to the custody of a state agency, department, individual, or entity. In most cases that we're seeing, the child is being thought to have a finding that they have been committed to the custody of an individual, typically a parent or some other family member or guardian. And then you have to have this, this finding, you have to be committed to the custody or declared dependent because reunification with one or both parents is not viable due to abuse, dependent, neglect, or a similar state law basis, and that the child cannot return to their home country because it would not be in their best interest. Um, this particular part here, the one or both parents, is a significant change that came out of the TVPRA. So before the TVPRA, you could only be eligible for this form of relief if you had been abused, abandoned, or neglected by both parents. Now under the TVPRA, you are eligible for this so long as you have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both parents. Um, so this is a new part of the law that's very beneficial. 
unfortunately, um, there's been some problems with the adjudication and, and the uh, recognition of this one parent SAJS status. So like I said, this is a two-part two -part process. So because you have to have been declared dependent on a juvenile court or committed to the custody of various groups, that is the state court component. So you have to get all of these findings of met while in the state juvenile court, and that can mean different things. That could be a family court or a probate court or other certain courts. Once you have that finding from the state court process, only then can you go to the immigration court and submit this petition to U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. I-360 Special Immigrant Juvenile Petition. When that petition is approved, then you can seek your adjustment of status to this petition at the end. And this is why this form of relief is complicated and also why, um, as an organization, it's difficult for NIJC because we don't handle cases in the state court. So there's a significant need for pro bono attorneys with family law experience who can handle the state court piece, and then the client can come back to us to handle the immigration. And on that note, I'm going to turn things over to Elizabeth. Okay. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cozio. I am a bilingual staff attorney with Catholic Charities Legal Assistance Department. We are part of the Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Chicago. We provide free and low-cost legal services to the underserved communities of Chicago through our um, advice line, direct representation in select cases, and um, as well as advice desks that we on all over Chicago and the surrounding counties. I am here today um, to explain what our role is in this SIJS process. Um, what we do is we attempt to get guardianship and custody orders so that minor children who come to NIJC um, become eligible for SIJS and they can initiate the process. Um, I should mention at the outset as well that we, just as NIJC represents the child, we represent the custodian or the guardian. So, you know, whenever we get a potential case, we all explain to the child anything that you tell us is not confidential because your potential guardian or custodian is our client. Um, also, we do not deal with juvenile court, foster systems, nothing like that. We are specifically at this time at least focusing on obtaining custody and guardianship for family, friends, family, friends, things like that. Guardianship. So what is it? Uh, a guardian essentially becomes the legal decision maker for a minor, does not terminate parental rights. Very important. There are certain requirements to become a guardian in the state of Illinois. First, you have to be capable of providing an active and suitable program of guardianship for the minor. You have to be over the age of 18. You have to, you cannot be of unsound mind. You cannot have been a judge disabled under the Probate Act. Um, not convicted of a felony unless appointment of the guardian would be in the best interest of the child. Um, also, the individual has to be a resident of the U.S. And I put an asterisk by that because resident is not defined in the statute, so it's unclear as to what the statute requires lawful status in the United States or just residing in the United States. Um, you know, there's no case law in point either, so we've been actively researching, researching this for several months. The judge in probate court, we believe, takes the stance that the individual has to have lawful status. Um, but, as I said, we're working on attempting to change your mind. Jurisdiction. Um, the probate court lacks jurisdiction to adjudicate a petition for guardianship where the parental rights have not been terminated, where the parents' whereabouts are known, and also um, the parent is willing and able to take care of the child. There are certain exceptions. One is when the parent relinquishes, volunteer relinquishes physical custody of the child. Um, and physical custody is separate from legal custody, and I'll be getting into that later on in the presentation. Um, also, the, if the parent has provided notice of the petition and either does not appear um, at the hearing or does not respond, then the court has jurisdiction. Um, also, the parent can consent to the appointment of the guardian, and that can be done in a written or notarized document, as well as consent in open court. Um, a lot of the children that were, or clients that we're getting have for a, to get guardianship and custody orders for children who come here with, you know, letters from parents giving custody guardianship to this specific individual, which makes it a little easier for us. Um, also, at the bottom, um, also, and if there's already a court-appointed guardian, then the court has jurisdiction to proceed with guardianship. Forms. It's typically best to go with the forms that are provided online on the Cook County Clerk's website or whatever county you're going to be practicing in. Um, but we've done a couple of forms by hand and it hasn't seemed to be an issue. You're going to need a probate division sheet, which essentially you check a box saying it's a 
guardianship petition for a minor over the person generally. Um, and then there's also a petition for guardianship court form, which has to be signed by the petitioner as well as the minor if the minor is over the age of 14. And this is signed in open court, so not initially when you file it. Um, also, you have to include something called an Exhibit A, and that lists all of the minors and nearest relatives in the following order. Spouse, usually the minor will not have a spouse, but you never know. Um, also, parents and adult siblings and any other, um, the nearest adult kindred. We've been putting just parents and siblings in our Exhibit A, and it hasn't seemed to be an issue. Um, also, you have to submit something called a verified petition for guardianship. I'll put an asterisk by that as well because this is changing. The probate court judge is very well aware of what's going on now with adjudication of SID applications. She's saying a lot of them are getting bounced back. So she is now changing what she wants in her verified petition. The title used to be verified petition for guardianship. She's now wanting something along the lines of verified petition for guardianship and petition for special immigrant juvenile status. We're not exactly sure why, because it's the state court part, not the immigration part, but um, it's what she wants. Um, generally, the verified petition before you know, said that a child was abandoned, abused, and neglected by one or both parents. Um, this child is eligible for SIJ, SIJ status. The guardian is um, fulfills all the statutory requirements. Um, but now, she wants the court. The judge is wanting specific allegations of the abuse, abandonment, or neglect in the verified petition. So you know, it, it's kind of it's a little you know in flux right now, especially because. Since everything's getting bounced back, she's requiring a lot more information, and it seems to change a little bit every time I go into that courtroom. So just keep that in mind. Supporting documents that you should attach. A copy of the minor's birth certificate with certified translation. A copy of the petitioner's identification, also with certified translation if it's applicable. And generally, you want something with a current address on it. Um, also, if the parents already gave consent to custody or guardianship over the minor, you want to include that with a certified translation as well. Um, also, a minor affidavit detailing the abuse, abandonment, or neglect. Um, this is something that we attached to the verified petition and that seemed to be sufficient. Um, we recently had a case in front of her where, you know, it was before we realized that she wanted a different form with the verified petition for guardianship. And we just, you know, alerted her to the fact that we had attached the abuse affidavit with all the allegations in it. And then she said, okay, if you do this, I want it as Exhibit A. So I want it first, right after the verified petition. Um, also, the affidavits don't have to get too detailed and, you know, kind of be aware that you don't want to re-traumatize the child. You know, if the child's gone through serious abuse, you don't want to have them go into so many details. And you also don't want to box yourself in so, you know, so, so that you don't lose any kind of credibility in front of the judge. So the child is not saying this happened on a Monday and in the affidavit and then in front of the judge says this happened on a Wednesday and then you have issues. Um, so just be cognizant of that as well. Um, we include our own background checks, FBI and DCFS. Um, but the court does it for you if you want. Um, it's just our own internal policy that we do it, and we attach it to the, uh, the verified, petition, uh, verified petition for guardianship. Okay, the filing process is also changing. All of these, all of these things are changing as time goes on, it appears. Um, but first, you go to room 1202 of the Daily Center. Uh, you go to the cashier. You present your petition. I'm not exactly positive the exact amount it costs. I believe it's $337 now. Um, but there are a few waivers available for individuals under 125% of the federal poverty guidelines or who otherwise uh, qualify under the Civil Legal Services Provider Act. So we generally don't, we do not represent clients generally who do not fall within one of those two categories. Um, and then right next to the cashier, there's a spot motion counter where you give your petition to the clerk. And the clerk will file it for you and will give you a court date. The, court, the clerks do not take the verified petition, so that big stack you're going to keep. They don't even, they won't file it either. They won't give you like a, a file stamp or anything. Um, so after you get your date, it's very important to go up to room 1806 and speak with the clerk to ensure that that date is actually available. Because I have, we have gone to the Daily Center, gotten our date, and then gone to 1806, and the clerk says, no, the judge is full that day and gives me a separate date. Um, so it's important to do that. Also, um, bring courtesy copies of the, all the documents to the judge at least two days beforehand. Oh, I should also mention, um, when you go to 1806 to confirm the court date there, you can also give your verified petition so the judge has it um, to review. Service. Okay, um, service for guardianship petitions is actually a lot less demanding than other forms of service, and the statute only requires actually in person or by mail. But as legal practitioners, we all know that it's always best to get some kind of to get some kind of proof that the person actually receives it. 
So if the person's within the United States and whereabouts are known, um, send certified mail as well as regular mail. That way, if the certified mail gets returned to you, um, but the regular mail does not, it's, you can say that this address actually exists and the person just rejected it. Um, for international service, registered mail seems to work. Um, the bullet points that I put down there about you know where that form of service is explicitly rejected by the receiving country, that's going to more apply towards custody, but something to keep in mind as well here. Um, only because you know different countries have different service requirements, and there are different treaties that pertain to how to serve people properly in different countries. I will get into that more later on, um, but it's just something to keep in mind when you're figuring out how you want to serve um, the individual. You want to give notice to the parents as well as everybody that you listed listed in Exhibit A. Um, also, uh, you want to give this uh, service at least three days before the hearing. Um, a lot of times, we get children who do not know the whereabouts of one of the parents, like absolutely do not know at all. And in those cases, you can fill out something called an affidavit for service by publication, which is also available on the Cook County Clerk's website. That means sign and notarize. And essentially, it's the petitioner saying, you know, I tried to find this individual. I couldn't find him, or this person lives out of state. Um, you do have to include a last known address if that's possible. If not, you just write unknown. Um, you would bring that to the eighth floor of the Daily Center, room 802. Um, give it to a very nice gentleman at the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin, and he will get everything set for you. He'll give you a date. Usually it's about 30, 30 days out. Um, what we tend to do is we file the affidavit for service of publication the same day we file the petition, just because it makes things go faster. We're getting a lot of kids who are aging out soon, so we want to try to get you know these orders as soon as we possibly can. And a lot of times, you know, you file your case, you try to serve the parent, there's no indication that the parent or actually received the petition, go back to the court and the judge is like, okay, I'm going to give you another date, try to serve by publication. We've done it where we filed it both at the same time and then the judge said that, we said we already served them and then she was fine with it and she entered the order that day. Okay, um, is anybody here familiar with the judge in 1806? Anybody been in front of her? She runs a very tight ship um, and she is very, very she can come up as rather intimidating, but she's fair. Um, is there a question? Uh, Judge Cesario? Um, so she comes up as intimidating, but she's very fair and she knows the law. Um, but there are certain things, keep in mind rules. Uh, you want to go in and check in with the clerk, but sometimes the judge is not like a whole lot of people there, so she might send you back to sit down. Um, attorneys sitting at the attorney table, keep your bags under the table. Also hang up your jackets. There's like a, a jacket thing. Okay. These are actually all tips that the security guard gave me the first time I went in there. I was very grateful. Um, I've actually, and I've actually seen her kick people out before many times. Um, so it's just make sure you act properly when you're in the courtroom. Um, so you check in with the clerk, as I said, and then you should always remind the petitioner as well as the minor to bring photo IDs because if they don't have it that day, then the judge won't be able to do anything. She won't be able to enter the order. Um, the photo ID for the petitioner should have a current address. Um, we've been able to um, have photo identification for the minor that are just from like the minor's high school because the minor has nothing else and that's been sufficient. Um, the questions that will likely be asked, that the judge will likely ask, he will ask the minor and the petitioner. She will usually not ask the attorney. And she'll ask things of the petitioner, where, where do you live? Do you rent your own? How many rooms do you have? How many people live in your house? Where do people sleep? Do you have a job? How much do you make? You know, where do you work? How long have you worked there? She's essentially looking for stability and to make sure that you know you don't the petitioner doesn't have 15 people living in a one-bedroom apartment. Um, she'll also also ask the minor questions. You enrolled in school? What are your future plans? If the minor has difficulty speaking English, she may start saying you have to speak. Make sure that you learn English. So be prepared for that as well. And also clearly whether or not the minor wants the petitioner to be his or her guardian. Where is the minor living through this process? With the guardian. And that not the no, not the guardian. It's, it's been transferred to that individual from ORR. Right. So when children are, are released, you know, we say they're sponsors just to cover parents, whatever family member they're being released to. They are given. They have no legal guardianship over the child. They're a parent, obviously. They're a parent. But for other family members, there is no legal authority given to that individual simply by virtue of their release to them. So. This is one of the reasons why they need to then seek a guardianship order to pursue us, I say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, question? 
you can request an interpreter when you get there. Um, sometimes it takes a little while because the judge has to go find the interpreter, but there are interpreters available. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So the order of the petition is granted. You're going to want to have the forms, actual forms, off of the website. The order appointing the guardian of the minor, as well as something called the oath and bond of representative no surety, essentially saying that this is guardianship over the person and not the estate of the minor, just usually because the minor doesn't have anything of value, no income, nothing. Um, you have to draft your own order with specific findings of fact to go along with the SIJS requirements, right? So you're going to want to, there's actually one that she had that the first time I was in front of her, she printed out and gave to me. She had something that she wants specifically, like the minor was abused, abandoned, and neglected by the parents. Um, it's not viable for the child to return to the parents because of the abuse, ban, and neglect. The child is dependent upon the court. Um, best interest to stay here. Um, things like that. So, you know, when you're drafting these orders and findings of fact, she's going to review them. And if she doesn't like the way they are, she may add on or she may ask you to redo it. So, are there any questions about guardianship before you go into custody? Yes. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, once you have an order like that, mm -hmm. the, um, the findings of the, you know, specific to the SIJS requirements. Right. Once you have that, and then you turn around, I think the next process is going to be about filing the I-360 with USCIS. Um, assuming this has been already been granted, all these issues have been in front of a, in front of a judge, is USCIS pretty inclined to then go ahead and approve it? We'll talk about that in the next section after we get through federal okay. yeah. right. Especially now they're being more scrutinized. Um, I forgot to mention this. I didn't put it on the PowerPoint as well, that you have to get the order certified. Um, so you go back to room 1202, I believe. Uh, the judge will put a stamp on there saying, okay, to certify. Then you bring it back down to 1202, and they certify it for you. And that's the order that you submit with the SIJS application. Okay, so custody. Custody also refers to legal decision making, doesn't refer necessarily to physical possession of the children. Um, types of custody, full custody and joint custody. Um, full custody gives the individual the final say in any decisions affecting the child. And when I say any, deci any decisions affecting the child, I'm talking about, you know, signing field reforms, bringing the child to the doctor, things like that. Um, joint custody refers to, general, generally refers to parents. So, you know, both of the parents have to agree on every single decision affecting the child. Um, and custody determinations are made according to the best interest of the child standard, which is not, um, it's very fluid. It's the judge essentially reviews all of the facts of the case and then makes a determination based upon what the judge believes is best for that child. And a number of things are kept in our, you know, our review, such as like when there are parents, the relationship between the parents, um, the, the educational needs of the child, things like that. There are actually factors um, enumerated in the um, Illinois Dissolution of Marriage Act, um, but it's not inclusive by any means. Okay, standing. Um, so there are different types of requirements for parents, step parents, grandparents, and non-parents. Um, I did not put this on the PowerPoint, this is very important. The child has to have lived in Illinois for at least six months to initiate a custody action. Um, so it's something very important to keep that in mind if you have a child and a potential custodian coming to your office, make sure the child's been here for at least six months before you initiate the action. Also, the potential custodian has to have been here for at least 90 days. Very important slide that I omitted. Um, so you have the parent, uh, the step parent. Okay, the statute, the Illinois uh, Dissolution of Marriage Act, has several different um, requirements for step parents, and I may not know. Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's four step parent. Um, the child is at least 12. Step parent had to have been married to the other parent for at least five years and live with the child during that time. The custodial parent is deceased or disabled. Um, step parent can provide for the care, custody, welfare for the child. The child wants to be with the step parent and it's in the child's best interest. Um, so, but if you want to refer to the statute, it lays it out very nicely there. Um, grandparent, also there are other very specific requirements. Um, one of the parents is deceased. The grandparent is the parent or step-parent of the deceased parent. At the time of the parent's death, the surviving parent was absent for more than a month and his or her whereabouts are not known, or that parent is incarcerated, or has been convicted of certain crimes which are listed in the statute, or is um, hasn't found guilty of violating an order of protection that protected the um, deceased parent and or the child. 
Um, Non-parent is actually quite easy compared to that. It just The child just has to have not been in the physical custody of one or both parents, That's it. Um, which is interesting. Um, okay, so to initiate a custody action, um, if, okay, so this is custody, the way we present custody is normally in the context of divorce and family law issues um, dealing with parents. So we're getting clients now who are non-parents who are we're taking the custody route. Um, so a lot of this, I'll try to explain how it's tweaked a bit. Um, but if the parents were not married when the child was born, um, if the mother wants to obtain sole custody of the child, she will first have to file a petition to establish paternity. Okay, and then once the paternity is established, then she can proceed and ask the court for sole custody. That said, it's important to remember there are a number of consequences that come with establishing paternity. Gives the father the same legal rights as the mother, meaning that the father can has equal footing to ask for custody, to ask for visitation, to ask for child support. Um, it's something important to keep in mind, particularly if there's a history of abuse, only because that could be opening the door to allowing the individual back into the life of the mother and the child. Um, so, petition for sole custody if the parents were married. The father is, I mean, excuse me, the husband is legally presumed to be the father, um, and so you would file a petition for sole custody, and same thing with a non-parent. Um, notice, okay, so the notice requirements here are a lot more rigorous than they are with guardianship. So within Illinois, I'm sure all very familiar with Illinois civil procedure, um, try to go to the sheriff, and then you can, you know, private, you can do publication, things like that. There are a number of steps that you have to go through to serve somebody within Illinois. Outside of Illinois, but within the United States, same thing, civil rules procedure apply where, you know, you go along with Illinois rules or the rules of the receiving state um, or where service is to be effectuated. International service, this is where it gets tricky. Okay, there is one, yeah, I have the names of them here. Okay, the Hague Convention on the Service Abroad of Judicial and Extrajudicial Documents in Civil or Commercial Matters. If the country where the petition is to be served is a signatory to this convention, it, the means of service have to go along with what the convention dictates. And that convention states that all service of these types of documents, petitions, have to be done through something called the central authority, okay, which in the United States is the United States Department of Justice, I believe, in Washington, D.C. So you get your petition, send it to them, then the U.S. Department of Justice sends it to the central authority in the receiving country, which we just did a, a case for Guatemala, and it's uh, the supreme... I can't remember the name. It's the Supreme Court, Supreme uh, Justice Tribunal or something like that. I think that's how you translate it. Um, but the thing about it is that with the Hague Convention, if they're signatories, it has to be done that way if the um, respondents' whereabouts are known. Um, there's also something called, if the country is not a signatory to the Hague Convention, we've been dealing with the Inter-American Convention on Letters Rogatory. Um, this, uh, the same means of service as the Hague Convention requires, um, is also presented as an option um, in, with this convention. And that's, there's been case law that's been, that has stated that, you know, this central authority requirement, the letters rogatory, is not a requirement, it's an option available. So, that said, many times if the country is not a signatory to the Hague Convention, but is a signatory to this Inter-American Convention on Letters Rogatory, registered mail may or may not be sufficient. So, something to ponder. Okay, so custody, when we're dealing with this, is something also that applies to parents. If we're talking about two different parents, um, they appear before a judge, there are certain things that the parents are required to go through before custody can be determined, uh, custody can be granted. First, the parents have to watch a video for, called Focus on the Children, it's a three-hour video. There is a fee, which I believe can be waived. Um, it's also available in Spanish. Um, then the parents have to go through mediation to figure out whether or not they can come to some kind of agreement. If nothing can be done through mediation, then we can ask that a child representative or GAL be appointed, which the, um, the person will do a home study, very general, interviewing the parents, the children, you know, looking at the living arrangements, making sure everything is okay. Um, then if that still doesn't work, you can go to a forensic evaluation, which is very, it's like putting your life under a microscope, pretty much. We're talking about having psychologists interview people and evaluate them and things like that. It's very, very, very intrusive in comparison to the home study. And then, you know, still nothing is, if nothing is agreed to, then hearing and trial. 
Okay, so if a custody petition is granted, it's the same thing. You want the orders the, with the findings of fact that coincide with the special immigrant juvenile status. And that's not something that we have seen, we have seen at least, as being required by the judges in parentage or um, family court. Um, it's just for purposes of applying for SIJ status, you have to make them specific, the findings of fact. And that is maybe problematic, especially because a lot of judges in family court are, are not really familiar with immigration law. So, and they're not really familiar with doing something like this. So the judge may get it and be like, I don't know what this is. They so kind of have to be prepared to explain, you know, why you need this order, what the findings of fact mean, things like that. Okay, so that concludes. Hopefully I got all the information in the small amount of time I had. Yes. Okay, yeah, that's one of the factors that I'm glad that you brought that up because that's one of the factors that we consider when we determine which route to take. Um, guardianship can be quick. It can be very quick. You get your first court hearing about a month or a month and a half after you file your petition. And then, you know, assuming there are no need for any, there's no need for any kind of continuance, you can actually get the order entered that day. Whereas custody um, can last a very long time because you have to file the petition, then you have to try to serve them. And since the service requirements are a lot more, like I said, demanding, um, you know, you have to wait a while to see if the respondent will respond. And then not, if the respondent doesn't respond, then you have to, you know, motion the court to get the person defaulted or to serve the person by publication. It can last months. It can last a very long time. Um, so that is a fact we keep in mind primarily for the um, minors who are close to aging out. Um, we try to go guardianship. I'm glad I actually brought that up too because it's a side note. Um, the potential custodian or guardian's legal status is also something that we keep in mind um, only because there is that unknown with guardianship and also the known that the judge, we believe, looks at it as requiring legal status. Whereas custody, there's no legal requirement. And in fact, you think about it, you know, there are undocumented parents in parentage court and divorce court all the time and they're granted custody. So there's are things to keep in mind when we decide which way we're going to go. Yes? Do you have to do both for the SIJS or one or the other? One or the other. And why would you choose one versus the other? Right, those are just the factors that I was um, explaining before. But it's just, it's, it's all a matter of strategy, you know, and whether or not the person qualifies under the Probate Act or the, um, the appropriate, the uh, Dissolution of Marriage Act. So like things that we kept in mind, like I was saying, is, you know, the amount of time that we have if the child ages out soon. Um, also, if the potential custodian or guardian has legal status, that's something else that we consider. So there are a number of things that, you know, after you become familiar with these areas of law, then you'll be able to strategize which way you want to go. Yes? You know, I couldn't speak to juvenile court because that's not, we're, we're not involved in that area. We're just um, with probate and family court. Yes, in the back. Is there just the one judge in probate court, and is that the same in family, or is it different? I believe, and I, I'm almost positive, actually, that there's one judge handling guardianship for minor petitions, minor guardianship petitions. Any other questions? Yes. They're not adopted. They're not adopted parents. Um, I don't believe so. I don't think so. I mean, you would have to answer that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I think, so I think, first of all, there would be some time needs because, for example, like if, if the child went the guardianship route and then got adopted, then that could undermine the ability to go to the day in the first, you know, because you have to be abused or abandoned or neglected by one or both parents, but if you have two new parents, then yeah, so there would be issues with that, but I think um, I I don't know. I don't think that's a clear. I don't think a clear answer to that. If you got adopted and were somehow able to maintain your SIJS, if you were able to petition for those parents, I don't think. It's good. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so we are always looking, as and I guess he is always looking for um, attorneys willing to volunteer their time. If you have any questions about any kind of volunteer, any opportunities that we have or anything else that we offer, we have a number of different programs if anybody's interested. Um, you can contact Ilda Bayena, our department director, Mary Lou Norwell, director of legal services, or myself. Thank you. Um, 
Um, to answer the question about juvenile court, my understanding is that, yes, they do still grant petitions that could lead to SIJS, but those are typically for kids that are already wards of the state um, and not typically individuals that we see. Um, typically, individuals would go through juvenile court if they were detained um, at the time in immigration custody, and because of the speed with which kids go through immigration custody, there typically is not the time for kids to go through the juvenile court route while they are detained here in Chicago. So my section for the rest of this is very, very short. The, um, the, the family or probate court process can often be the most complicated part, although it's gotten more complicated through USCIS as well. So once you have that predicate order, you're done with the state court piece. And sorry, by predicate order, I mean your state court order, whether it's your family court or juvenile court or probate court, whatever. Um, it's deemed the predicate order. It's the predicate to getting your special immigrant juvenile status. So you have that order. The child can return to an immigration attorney and begin the, the SIJS process. So this itself also is a two-part process on the immigration side. So first you file this form I-360, I which is a petition for special immigrant juvenile status. Um, and you file this with a state court order and some other limited supporting documents. This particular petition does not provide the individual with any immigration relief. It just establishes that they meet that criteria, that they have established that they've been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both parents and can't return to their home country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, to the question of, of is the state court order enough, technically you would think it should be, right? The state court has the authority to determine, make that determination regarding the child. The immigration piece should just be to decide whether they've met that criteria based on the order, and that should be sufficient. Unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot of issues across the country relating to immigration adjudication of these petitions, whereby they are basically looking behind the state court order and demanding additional evidence that the state court order was actually bona fide. There are obviously a number of concerns with this relating to the authority and jurisdiction of the immigration entity to look behind the state court order and the expertise to make that determination. Um, in some parts of the country, this isn't an issue at all, and you file your state court order, and you file it with your, your, your petition, and that's it. Here in Illinois, it has been a problem, and it's something that um, has been an inconsistent problem. We have had some cases adjudicated without any problem, and others, um, we've received a lot of requests for additional evidence to establish that the underlying state court order was really bona fide. Um, so if you have one of these cases, you'll definitely want to look into the current situation. If it's a pro bono case of NIJC, strategize with us about what additional evidence you may want to provide with your I-360 petition. The second part of the process is the I-485, which is the application to adjust status to actually get legal relief. So you're app applying to adjust status to lawful permanent residency or to get your green card. Um, so there's no filing fee with the first one. There is a filing fee with this, the second one. It is a bit hefty, although you can apply for a fee waiver. Um, you may submit, submit some additional supporting documents here as well. But if your I-360 has been approved, then this next spot generally should not be um, terribly difficult to get past. Um, there's two different ways you can do this. If you have a client who's in immigration court proceedings, then um, the only entity that has jurisdiction over the 485 is the judge. However, the only entity that has jurisdiction over the I-360 is U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, so you have to do it separately. You file the I-360 first with USCIS, it's approved, then you file your I-485 with the immigration judge. If you want, once your um, I-360 is approved, you can ask the immigration judge to terminate your proceedings. You can go back to USCIS for your 485 adjudication. Typically, whether or not you do that is a strategic decision, given some of the issues that we're currently seeing with adjudications of these petitions by USCIS, we would try to keep things in court as much as we can. So if you get the I-360 approved, typically you'd want to stay in court for your 485 simply because we've been seeing a lot of problems with the adjudication of these petitions by USCIS. So some brief practice pointers from the immigration side of things. So there's a disconnect in most states um, regarding the state requirements for juvenile court, whether it be probate or family court or juvenile court, and the requirements under the Immigration and Nationality Act for special immigrant juvenile status. So under the Immigration and Nationality Act, you can seek special immigrant juvenile status up to age 21. However, for most state court laws, it limits your guardianship or your custody order or whatnot to under 18. So generally, even though under immigration law you could be eligible to seek this relief until you're 21, you need to get your predicate order before you're 18 and file before you're 18 so that the predicate order is still valid at the time you are filing it. So generally in Illinois, you must file your, your Form I-360 before the child turns 18. 
as long as, long as you do that, then the age is preserved and you're, the, the application is fine, even if the child ends up being 19 or 20 at the time the petition is actually granted. As I mentioned, adjudications of these petitions differ significantly across the country. Um, it's an issue that organizations across the country have been advocating with without much success with um, USCIS and with DHS headquarters for some time. Um, but again, if you have a pro bono case with NIJC for special immigrant juvenile status, do check with us um, to strategize on what evidence you may want to submit to try to avoid getting any denial. And that is it for the very quick overview of special immigrant juvenile status. Um, like I said, this is a quick overview of these forms of relief. It's not in-depth. On NIJC's website, we do have a manual which is in the process of being updated, along with many other materials on how to apply for this form of relief. Um, and if you know, we have a significant need for these types of cases, we will likely hold a training as well that's more in-depth on this particular form of relief. Any particular questions? Yes. I would, say the, I would say the majority of children are eligible for this form of relief. Their ability to actually get that form of relief is more difficult because um, they may be turning 18 very soon. Um, they may not necessarily have access to the process. Um, and also because of the problems with adjudication with USCIS across the country. So for example, we see with, within the children who are released to Illinois, we have a lot of children who are being released to Bloomington or to Joliet or to various counties where we have very few resources to refer them to for the family court process or the, the probate court process. Um, and if they can't complete that process, they can't go to the immigration side of things. There have also been some states that have had laws that have basically, um, I should say, um, decisions have come down from different courts across the country saying that despite the statute establishing the existence of one parent SIJS, that you can't really get SIJS unless you've been abused, abandoned, or neglected by both parents. So even though technically under the plain reading of the law as it currently exists, the vast majority of kids should be eligible. Their ability to actually access that relief I think is much more limited. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if our SIJS overview was, was, was very brief and short, our asylum um, description is going to be very even more brief. Um, typically, NIJC holds an asylum training for pro bono attorneys that's about three hours long in and of itself. So this is going to be an incredibly quick overview. Um, again, I can't emphasize enough that we have um, many, many pro bono materials on our website, including recordings of prior asylum trainings, a very in-depth manual, and other materials if this is a type of case that you would like to get involved in. Um, before I talk about what asylum is, um, I would note that in addition to being eligible for SIJS, I would say a very large percentage of the children that we see and that other organizations see across the country are eligible for asylum protection. Um, at the same time that many children have been crossing the border, there's been many adults and families with children crossing the border from Central America who are eligible for asylum. And so although, again, the issue of the children is in the media all the time right now and with, with very good reason, here in Chicago and at NIJC, our biggest need for pro bono assistance is really pro bono attorneys to handle the asylum cases of adults and, and um, families who have children as well, or um, in some cases, adults who entered as unaccompanied children and now are older. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. So, um, does anybody know the difference between being a refugee and being an asylee? <laughs> Any non-immigration attorneys who know the difference? <laughs> yeah. Sort of. So, so refugees and asylum seekers have to meet the same definition. They all have to establish that um, they have fled their country because they fear persecution um, on account of one of five protected characteristics, your race, your religion, your nationality, your membership in a particular social group, or your political opinion. And that persecution has been by the government or an entity you can't or won't control, and that you can't return to your country for that reason. Um, but a refugee is someone who's met that definition outside of the United States, has been found to meet that definition by a, an authority, and has entered the United States with formal lawful refugee status. An asylum seeker is someone who's in the United States and maybe has entered legally. Maybe they entered on a student visa or a tourist visa. Um, maybe they're still in lawful status. Maybe they overstayed that status. Or maybe they crossed into the United States illegally without inspection. 
But however they got here, they are in the United States now, and they are requesting protection. So they are in the United States, and they have to prove that they meet this definition. So um, basically what asylum does is it provides protection for people who can meet this definition. This protection asylum can lead to a green card, permanent residency, and can eventually lead to citizenship as well. Um, Asylum also has benefits for other family members. If someone obtains asylum, they can then petition for their legal spouse, um, or they can petition for their biological children or, or lawfully adopted children as well. So like I said, this is the definition for asylum, and this is really how we break down the form of relief when we're screening a case, and how we recommend that pro bono attorneys break down their legal arguments when they're making a brief to an immigration judge or an asylum officer about their case. So first you have to establish, and this comes from an international definition, um, you have to establish that your client has a well-founded fear, the first element, of persecution perpetuated by the government or an entity the government can't or won't control, and it's on account of one of those five protected grounds. Um, so again, this is an international definition. It comes from the, the Refugee Convention after World War II, but it's been codified in domestic law in the Immigration and Nationality Act. So the well-founded fear component is a burden of proof. So to establish your client has a well-founded fear, you have to show that your client has a reasonable possibility of suffering persecution in their home country. The Supreme Court has held that this is a pretty low standard. It's only a 1 in 10 chance of persecution. The difficulty is, even though it's a 10% chance, it's a 10% chance of something that has not yet happened yet. So you're establishing something that's going to happen in the future. And that's what can be difficult. There are two ways that you can establish this, this well-founded fear. First, you can establish it by showing that you suffered past persecution by the government or an entity the government can't or won't control on account of one of the five protected grounds. If you do that, it creates a rebuttable presumption that you will be persecuted in the future. And that's how you meet your, your burden of proof, your 10% chance. But many of our clients haven't suffered past persecution in the past. They left before anything happened. They were fortunate enough to go. Like Molly talked about before, um, you know, we'll see um, girls coming through the shelters who say, you know, my friend had been pursued by a gang member, and she said no to him, and he killed her. I started being pursued by a gang member, and I left before anything could happen to me. So she can't necessarily establish past persecution because she was fortunate enough to leave before any, anything happened. But she can still meet her burden of proof. It's just a little bit more difficult because she doesn't have that rebuttable presumption. She has to show on her own that she has a reasonable possibility of persecution in the future. In addition to establishing your burden of proof, you have to establish this on, on account of prong. Um, the persecution definition, which I skipped here, um, persecution is not defined in case law anywhere, um, but we have some, not defined in statute anywhere, but we have some very good case law here in the Seventh Circuit that explains what persecution is. And there's also very good case law that says that the harm for a child can rise to the, the level of persecution even if that same harm wouldn't rise to the level of persecution for an adult. So really recognizing that trauma that children endure is, um, occurs differently and, and, and um, affects an individual differently when they're a child than they're an adult, which can be very useful in asylum cases. For the on account of prong, um, you have to establish a nexus, a connection between the persecution your client suffered or fears and one of those five protected grounds. And there's case law that says that connection, the nexus, has to be one central reason. So the protected ground has to be one central reason that the client was persecuted or will be persecuted in the future. It doesn't have to be the only reason, it doesn't have to be the primary reason, but it has to be one of the central reasons. And then you have to connect that to one of the five protected grounds. It's really important to keep these two elements separate. A protected ground exists on its own independently, whether or not your client can show that he was persecuted on account of that protected ground. So for example, if your client fears persecution because he's a Christian, your client is a Christian and Christianity exists as a protected ground, whether or not your client can show he was persecuted because he's a Christian. This is an important distinction to make because when we talk about a lot of the claims that children present, which we'll talk about in a second, judges tend to conflate those two elements and say, well, you can't prove that you were persecuted because you refused to join a gang. Therefore, you haven't established that being in a gang or refusing to join a gang is, is a particular social group. And that really conflates two elements and creates a lot of problems for the legal analysis. So these five protected grounds, um, we don't see race, religion, and nationality claims very frequently. Of the three, we probably see religion the most, but race and nationality 
we don't see very often. And those are pretty well-established definitions. People know generally race can include your ethnicity or a tribal group or a clan, and it can overlap with nationality as well. Religion can be um, a claim because you are being prevented from practicing your religion, because you're being forced to practice the religion you don't want to practice, anything like that. Political opinion is, is your stereotypical asylum claim. When people think of asylum, they think about political asylum. Um, it can be based on your actual or your imputed political opinion. So again, in a lot of the cases that we see where children are fleeing gangs because they've been forcibly recruited to join the gang and they've been told, if you don't join, we're going to kill you, in some cases we can present these as political opinion claims. Because in refusing the gang, the gang imputed an anti-gang political opinion to these children. Because remember, in these countries, the gangs have incredible power. They often have more power than the actual government in the country. And resisting the gang can really be deemed as a political act. So in some cases, we can make that argument and say that this child is seeking asylum because the gang imputed an anti-gang political opinion to him and targeted him on that account. Not all cases we can do that, though. And so many of these cases often fall in this final prong, the membership in a particular social group category, which is probably the most ambiguous and the most complex grounds for asylum that currently exists, but is also one of the most common bases for asylum. So membership in a particular social group is not defined anywhere in the statute. Nobody quite knows where the term came from. The, the, apparently the Swedish delegation threw it in at the very last minute when the refugee convention was created and never really explained what it meant. Um, so the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the administrative appellate level in the immigration system, defined it in the 1980s in this decision called Matter of Acosta. And what they did was they looked at the other protected grounds and they said race and nationality are two characteristics you can't change. Religion and political opinion are two characteristics you should not be required to change. So based on that, we are going to decide that membership in a particular social group means a group of individuals who share a characteristic that either you should not change, you should not be required to change, or you cannot change, so combining the other two characteristics. So based on that, throughout the years, a number of different particular social groups have been established based on characteristics that people cannot change or should not be required to change. So people have sought asylum based on the particular social group of Honduran males, Guatemalan women and girls, former members of a gang, um, members of a particular family, Guatemalan citizens without familial protection, um, former members of the Attorney General's office, any group where you can show that you either should not be required to change that characteristic or you cannot change it. So for example, if there's something that occurred in the past, that's automatically an immutable characteristic. So in the case of, again, children who have resisted gang members, once they resisted the gang, they can't change that. It's a past act, it's immutable, and it's a characteristic that they can't change, and it has, it has marked them as being a gang resistor. And so when children are being targeted because they resisted the gang, that's often how we will present these claims. Similarly, in the case um, of, of girls who are being targeted to be the girlfriends of gang members or who have been subjected to family violence or domestic violence, we often argue that they are being targeted because of their gender. They are a woman or a girl in Guatemala. And in a, a particular culture where there's high levels of, of violence against women, where maybe the gangs are able to um, harm women with impunity, um, and so we're able to establish that you know, that's their gender. They can't change that characteristic. It's something that they cannot change. Um, despite the fact that this very clearly fits within this decision in 1985, there have been a number of decisions since this 1985 decision that have moved to restrict the definition of membership in a particular social group and make it much more difficult to establish that group. So um, some recent decisions have said that to be a particular social group, not only does the characteristic need to be immutable, you also need to show that the characteristic is visible or recognizable by society and that you've defined your group in a particular enough way that it's not too amorphous and that it's a discrete group. Now, those are not requirements that any other ground for asylum requires. Again, if you're a Christian, you're a Christian, you're a Christian. Like, that's it. You don't have to establish that anyone in your community recognizes Christianity as a religion. You don't have to show that Christianity is a visible religion. But they've added this criteria to these particular social groups. Um, and in the decisions that they've issued about particular social groups, it's been very clear that they're results-driven decisions. So all four of the decisions that have re restricted asylum in this way have involved individuals who are fleeing gang recruitment in Central America. So it was very clear from the way the decisions were written that these were intended to make it very difficult for people who are fleeing gang violence in Central America to be able to get asylum. We're very fortunate here in the Seventh Circuit that we have a number of decisions here that have struck down those Board of Immigration Appeals decisions, but it's an area of law that is very much in flux. 
And so while we see these immigrant children coming in, one of the things that's really important to providing them with protection is to help develop the case law so that it's stronger so that these children can seek relief. Because again, when you see many children going to parts of the United States where there are limited legal services, many attorneys are not going to be willing to take on the case of an unaccompanied child if they don't think there's any chance of success. Asylum cases can use up a lot of time and resources. So in addition to representing the children, we strongly encourage pro bono attorneys who are interested in this area to consider taking on any case, whether it be involving an adult or a family, involving particular social group claims, because the more we can strengthen this law, the easier it will be for the children who are coming up in the system to present their claims moving forward. Any questions about that? Okay, so I mentioned before when we talked about the TVPRA um, that there's a one-year filing deadline for asylum. This doesn't really apply to unaccompanied children, but um, once the children are released from custody or turn 18, it's not quite so clear whether or not it still applies. So if you're representing a child who has been released from custody, generally you still want to apply, apply with the one-year deadline, comply with the one-year deadline so much as you can to avoid any problems. Because if you miss the one-year deadline and you're not found to meet an exception to the one-year deadline, then you will not be eligible for asylum. Obviously, there's some very good arguments to make regarding children if they miss the one-year deadline because they are children. But again, it's something you want to avoid if at all costs. So a quick overview of the process which we've talked about before and the TVPRA. So normally when somebody is in the immigration court system, they only apply before the immigration judge. If they're not in the immigration court system, then they get to apply first with the asylum office. And then if they're not granted by the asylum office, they go back to immigration court and they get a second bite at the apple. Um, immigrant children who are unaccompanied get to go through a special process whereby even though they're in immigration court, they get to apply at the asylum office. If the asylum office does not grant their case, they're referred back to immigration court and also get that second bite at the apple. Filing for asylum um, is more involved than filing for special immigrant juvenile status. Um, whether you're filing before the asylum office or the immigration court, it, is, um, it involves a fair amount of documents. Um, and it's the most important being your affidavit, which we'll talk about briefly. But these are typically the, all the types of, of application forms you want to provide. The I-589 is actually the asylum application. And then you're going to be submitting other supporting documents, including an index and a brief or a legal memo. Credibility is the most important part of an asylum case, establishing that your client is credible, which can be very difficult when working with children because children have a harder time maintaining a consistent story, remembering chronology, and even though your client may be a child, and to you or me it may make sense that he may not be able to remember very clearly what happened when he was 10 years old, that's not often how the adjudicators view it. And it's very easy for an adjudicator to deny a case based on credibility. So you want to be very careful when crafting your client's affidavit, um, something that Elizabeth mentioned earlier about not boxing in your client applies just as well here. You want to provide as many details as you can without really um, hooking your client to details that he or she may not remember during the stress of a hearing or an interview. So we recommend avoiding dates, avoiding specific times, avoiding specific numbers so that your client doesn't come into the interview and say, you know, four gang members stopped me on the street when in his affidavit he said three, and now the asylum officer is going to say, you're, I don't believe your story, you're, you're, you're inconsistent. Everything in an, an asylum case matters, so you want to corroborate everything, which is, again, why these cases can be somewhat resource intensive, um, although we, we endeavor to provide you with as many resources as we can so that this is less time consuming for you. Um, you typically will need to provide your client's affidavit, country condition documents, maybe medical documents if your client's been physically harmed in the past. Mental health evaluations, particularly for children, can be very important to help establish the trauma that was suffered. Um, because of the complex asylum law right now, it's often very useful to provide a country conditions expert who can say, you know, I'm an expert on conditions in Honduras and I can tell you that this is how gang members are currently treating kids who resist recruitment. Um, so there are many, many ways that you can document your case and many ways that we recommend you do so. So that's a very incredibly quick overview of asylum. Any, any quick questions here? And we're going to move on to our one last opportunity. Yes. Sure. So the question was how long the process takes. And that can vary significantly. Um, because children get to go to the asylum office first, the asylum office tends to be a quicker adjudication. And if they get granted there, then, then their whole case is over. So potentially it could be as quick as, um, you know, 
one to six months from filing, you could get a decision at the asylum office. Um, if you get sent back to the immigration court, the process can take much longer. In some cases, at the Chicago Immigration Court right now are being set for merits hearings in 2019. Now, with that being said, you may have seen in the news that the immigration system is expediting the processing of kids' cases. So right now, we're seeing kids getting set for hearings very quickly. We've heard that asylum office interviews for kids are going to go very quickly. So it's possible, which, and we're trying to slow that whole process down because more than anybody, kids need more time to prepare their cases. But it's possible that the process could be even quicker in the months coming forward. Yes. Um, I have heard that only anecdotally. I have witnessed it in court. I've only heard it anecdotally at the asylum office. There's So the question is whether judges will grant continuances while the case is pending at the asylum office. And so far, we've had no problem with that. And a lot of judges are actually willing to close the case while they wait for the asylum office to adjudicate it, because it doesn't do the court any good to keep a case pending on their docket when they have no jurisdiction over the asylum case in the first place. There's one more question in the back, or did he get answered? No? OK. OK, so prosecutorial discretion. So this is a form of relief that really isn't exactly relief, um, but it's something that's become really important in immigration court recently. So in, in a normal context, we think of prosecutorial discretion in many different ways. So it could mean a, prosec a prosecutor deciding not to prosecute, dropping the charges, um, you know, agreeing to a plea, various, various different things. In the immigration context, unfortunately, um, immigration and customs enforcement really only interprets it in, in three fairly narrow ways, and for the most part, in, in one one specific way. So the three ways they typically interpret it are administrative closure, termination, and deferred action. And these are all somewhat similar options. So administrative closure means that your client's case will be taken off the active docket. Your client remains in removal proceedings and remains in the same status that they were in when they entered removal proceedings. If they were seeking asylum, they remain a pending asylum applicant. They cannot leave the country. They don't have formal lawful status but nobody is actively trying to deport them at that time. Their case is on hold, basically, until somebody, the judge, the government attorney, or you, decide that you want to ask the, the judge to recalendar the case and set it for another hearing again. Um, in the case of people who are set for administrative closure, their case could remain in that status indefinitely. So we, in many cases where we have a client whose case has been administratively closed, it's been that way for years, we have no idea if it'll ever be opened again, and that can be a good thing. Termination means proceedings are actually terminated. Your client is not in removal proceedings anymore. The case is over. Your client may not have any status, but for one reason or another, the immigration judge and the government attorney have decided not to pursue removal, and so the case is terminated. This rarely happens and will typically only happen if the individual is eligible for some other form of relief they can seek before another entity. So if you remember, we talked about how with SIJS, you file your I-360 petition. Once that's approved, you can file your petition to adjust your status. And you could ask the judge to terminate your proceedings so you could file that application with USCIS. That typically is the only situation in which the government will agree to terminate is if the individual is going to seek relief from another entity and has shown that they are prima facie eligible for that particular form of relief. And then deferred action can be granted for people who are having their proceedings terminated or administratively closed or a wide variety of things. But basically, it actually can defer the removal of somebody. So um, with administrative closure, they're still in removal proceedings. They're just not being actively pursued at that point. Deferred action is typically literally deferring the removal of an individual. It could be somebody who actually has a removal order and it's going to be deferred. Technically, this is what the, the children and the young adults who sought DACA have sought. So their removal is being deferred. Um, and they are being granted some other benefits. Often the benefit of deferred action is you can also seek employment authorization along with it. So about uh, two years ago or so, Immigration and Customs Enforcement issued several memos um, um, which detailed why the government would be willing to exercise prosecutorial discretion in one of these three ways. And it's typically based on certain enforcement priorities. So whether somebody has a prior removal order, whether somebody has a criminal history, how long they've been here in the United States, whether they have family here, those sorts of things. These memos are all available on our website. So for unaccompanied children, it's a little different. So for the most part, the priorities that the government has stated would 
cause them to be willing to exercise prosecutorial discretion relate to length of stay here, ties to the United States, all things that these children don't typically have because they just arrived. Um, so what we typically try to argue is the other criteria that they can meet and their connection typically to a parent. So when we've talked about before how some children don't have any relief available to them, but some of those children who have no relief may have one or two parents here who've maybe been here for 10 years. They may be undocumented, but they've been here for a long period of time. Maybe they have a U.S. citizen child or two who are the U.S. citizen siblings of the unaccompanied child who just entered. Maybe the parent is trying to pursue some other relief, maybe not. Um, but all of those factors could make for a prosecutorial discretion case for the child. So this is really, in many cases, almost a last-ditch effort to provide the child with some way to stay in the United States, particularly when there's no caretaker in the home country, when both parents are here. It's clearly in the child's best interest to stay here, but there's no best interest mechanism in immigration court. There's no immigration relief that's available to a child simply because it's in the child's best interest to stay here. And so this is where we've been trying to utilize prosecutorial discretion. So for example, we have used it in a case of um, a child who, whose whole family was here in the United States and is deaf and was from Mexico and had a number of resources here that he was utilizing but couldn't utilize those resources in the home country. Um, we've recommended prosecutorial discretion for children who, um, particularly when they're younger, maybe under 14 years old, who have one or two parents here, maybe, one, maybe mom is here for 10 years, dad is not in the picture. The situation back home is really violent, maybe not enough for asylum because the harm hasn't been directed at the child, but it's a bad situation. Um, really compelling humanitarian factors. So we sort of try to tie on to the factors that would be useful for the parent who's been here for many years and use that for the child to recommend prosecutorial discretion. Um, these are really compelling cases generally, but they're cases that unlike some of our other cases we may take, we really can provide you with no guarantee that you're going to have success because it's incredibly dependent on the judge and the government attorney and how cooperative they are. However, in the cases we have presented so far, we have had um, a fair amount of success with getting the judge to agree to administratively close cases indefinitely so that children can stay here. Um, last year we had a case involving two young girls from Honduras. Who both of their parents had been here for a long period of time. Um, they had U.S. citizen siblings. They had been cared for by a grandparent back in the home country, but grandparent was abusive. They came here. The judge determined that there wasn't enough for, for asylum, um, which we disagreed with, but um, that she decided to grant administrative closure because of all the compelling factors. And you know, for the kids, this is one of the best things they could have hoped for, because they can stay here with their parents indefinitely, recover from the trauma they suffered in their home country, and really reunite with their parents. Um, so this is a form of relief we anticipate seeing a lot more of and would encourage attorneys um, to look at this as an option, more unusual option, doesn't necessarily give a full relief for your clients, but really gets them what they need to stay here with their family. And then I quickly wanted to touch on a few other forms of relief that may come up in the course of your case and that are on our case list because these often relate to unaccompanied children as well. One thing that we've really discovered as we intake these children um, is that Many of their parents who are here are actually eligible for immigration relief as well and have never known it. One of the forms of relief they're often eligible for is for, for a relief called a U visa, which is for victims of certain crimes who have assisted in the prosecution or investigation of that crime. They can seek this U visa, which can lead to a green card and eventually citizenship, and children can be derivatives and get derivative status through their parents. So um, many of the cases on our case involving U visas also involve children, they're just not the primary individual seeking that relief, they're derivative. Um, similarly, it is with the Violence Against Women Act. So this provides protection for certain victims of abuse by a lawful permanent resident or a U.S. citizen relative, typically a spouse, but it can be other relatives as well. Um, often children are able to access protection through their parents in that way, or in some cases the children have been victims um, themselves and can access protection in that way. TVs are for certain victims of labor or sex trafficking. Um, most commonly, what I think we see nowadays is children who are um, trying to escape to the United States and as they're going through Mexico, the routes to the United States are heavily controlled by the cartels. Um, many of the cartels will only allow the children to pass through if they will carry packages from them to, for them through to the United States. Um, so this is something we've seen a lot more frequently, um, children who have been victims of labor trafficking um, to the United States. Um, we don't have as many of these cases currently on our list because a lot of the children we see in the shelters who would be victims of trafficking are going on to other parts of the country. Um, but this is another form of relief that can become available. And also something if you're representing a child you always want to keep an eye out for because 
this is probably the most difficult information for a child to reveal and may not necessarily reveal it in the one or two hour intake that we may do with the child before we accept their case for some other form of relief. So you may be representing a child in asylum, and the more you hear about the story, you realize that the child had actually been trafficked to the United States as well. Um, this is specifically for people who have been trafficked here, if they were trafficked in another country and then came here, that's typically not sufficient. Um, but if that information comes out, that's definitely something, if it's an NIJC pro bono case, that you want to talk to us about to see if the child could be eligible for any other forms of relief. And then finally, family petition. So most people know that you can get immigration status if a family member petitions for you. Um, so if um, you know a child comes here and their parent maybe is married to a U.S. citizen, um, or their parent is um, got citizenship or permanent residency, they may, able, may be able to get status through their parent. Um, because of the way the law is currently established, most of these children would have to go back to their home country and uh, get their status through the consulate, which is not something that many of these children would be willing to do given what they escaped from. But again, it may be something that they would want to um, pursue. And if information like this would ever come out when you're meeting with a client, you should, of course, reach out to NIJC if it's an NIJC case. And that was a very, very fast overview of, of the primary forms of relief that we typically see unaccompanied children seeking. Um, are there any questions at this time? And then I'll say a few last words. All right, well, thank you all for coming and, and sitting through this very quick run through. I can't emphasize enough, you know, as, as much as children need assistance right now, adult asylum seekers need assistance as well in ways that will benefit many of these children. If you are interested in taking a pro bono case, please do take a look at our case list of all the cases that are available. If you're interested in getting involved with either the Know Your Rights presentations or with taking a case, you can contact Carolina. Uh, we'd be happy to talk to you afterwards as well, and we'll be around as well if you have any additional questions you want to ask separately. Fill out your evaluation. You can turn it over to Carolina. She'll give you your CLE, and we really appreciate you coming.